Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Joseph Attic, Executive Chairman of ID for Africa, and I'm pleased to welcome you back to a whole new season of timely topics and lineups of world-class experts. This is our 26th livecast, and with it today, we continue the dialogue on identity matters with renewed momentum for the fourth season. We don't want you to miss what we have in the pipeline for you. So please keep an eye on the ID for Africa communications for more details. And we thank you for staying with us. Thank you also goes to our development partners, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for their support of our livecasts. As you can imagine, the livecasts are not simple webinars. They are fully curated programs requiring detailed research and interviews developing quality live content and producing it as digital public goods available on YouTube takes significant effort. So we thank the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for enabling all of that and for helping us to keep the community together in dialogue around what matters in ID4D and digital transformation. Speaking of YouTube, I'd like to remind you to please like, share, and subscribe to the ID for Africa YouTube channel. This small gesture will allow your movement to continue to scale its outreach to a broader community by telling the Google algorithm that this is content worth promoting to others. So we thank you in advance for your help. Before we start, I'd like to make two important announcements. First, today we have unveiled the ID for Africa Ambassadors Class of 2022. As you may know, the program was launched in 2016, and since then, it has steadily grown to become a major pillar supporting the ID4D agenda in Africa. The ambassadors act as liaison officers between ID for Africa and the identity stakeholders in their countries. These men and women are the engine that drives the movement forward and ensures that it remains responsive and connected to the realities on the ground. They give us roots in 48 countries in Africa. Being an ambassador is not just an honorary position. These volunteer civil servants work throughout the year to ensure their countries are not left behind. They are among the continent's best and brightest, united not by a political will, but by their faith in Africa's potential and their commitment to working together to realize it. In response to demand from several African countries, we have expanded the program this year to allow all countries, regardless of their size, to appoint two individuals instead of just one, one ambassador and one deputy. This year's class includes a total of 85 civil servants with 33% with female, as compared to 24% last year. So we are pleased to see the program identifying and empowering more women, and we will continue to do so. Let me also share with you some interesting statistics about the 2022 class. Um, as you can see from the job classification, the majority are from the senior decision-making leadership and not just operational leadership. And when we look at what sectors they come from, we see the majority comes from the identity authorities or civil, civil registration. But there is a broad representation from the traditional identity stakeholders, such as electoral commissions, ICT, banking, health, border control, social services, and the president's or PM's offices. So please join me in warmly welcoming the returning and new men and women who constitute this 2022 record setting ambassador class. We look forward to working with them in pursuit of our collective mission in 2022 and beyond. You can use the chat to wish them success. And we now also count as Ambassador Emeritus those who have successfully served for a period of four years or who have rendered exceptional service to their country's cause of identity during their term. While they have moved on, they will continue to be friends of the movement and advocates for identity for all. We thank all the outgoing ambassadors, emeritus or otherwise, and we wish them all the best in their next endeavors. You can learn more about the ambassadors program and read the bios of the 2022 class on the website dedicated to the program. The link is provided in the chat 
and in the comments area on YouTube. Next, let me update you on what is in the pipeline for this season. Last month, we issued a call for speakers on the topic of mobile for identity management and for inclusive ID for D. The call generated over 100 submissions, so it became clear this is a mega topic that cannot be covered in a single episode. At a minimum, it's going to require a trilogy, which we are planning to run starting with part one on February 23rd and part two and three on March 9th and 23, respectively. The March 9th episode will also celebrate International Women's Day by including segments related to the empowerment of women and girls through mobile. The record response is a sign of our times. Mobile has become so integral in our lives that it's impacting all aspects of it, including our identity, and it merits to dominate our pursuits for knowledge exchange in 2022. Here is the detailed program for the trilogy. <clears throat> Given that we are running this as a trilogy and we have more time, we have extended the call for speakers till February 11th, but only for part two and three. If you have something to say on the specific topics listed for those two episodes, you have a second chance to submit or revise your prior submissions. If you have already submitted and you think you have good thematic fit, there's nothing more to do but to wait for us to contact you. The interview and selection process for the first episode has already started, and we expect to announce the lineup for that part by February 8th. Back to today's episode, as you can see, it consists of three segments. First one is the Trilogy Roundup. In this segment, four experts representing development agencies, government, civil society, and industry will share their key takeaways from the Dark Side of Identity Trilogy. In the second segment, the highly popular Ion Africa returns with Ion Uganda. We're pleased to have with us NIRA's leadership to report on their progress, the challenges they are tackling, and the roadmap of projects and timelines. Then in the third segment, we will have a mega panel of thought leaders with whom I will engage on deconflicting the many notions of digital identity. I will defer my remarks for that segment until after we finish segment two, but I can tell you, this is one of the most forward-looking segments that we've ever done, and it's very timely. Stay with us, find out why you cannot afford to be left out of this conversation. Something big is coming our way and you need to prepare for it by first knowing about it. We're now ready to welcome the participants in this episode. Several of the panelists from segment three cannot join us at this minute because of the time zone or because of event conflict, but will be with us live later in the program. We're pleased to have the following panelists in the order of appearance. Dr. Alan Gelb, Senior Fellow, Center for Global Development, Pam Dixon, Founder and Executive Director, World Privacy Forum, Tumelo Robletsi, Principal Secretary, Ministry of Home Affairs, Lesotho, Stefan Hofstetter, Managing Partner and Senior Consultant at Sequoia Executive Consultants, Rosemary Kisimbo, Executive Director, National Identification and Registration Authority of Uganda, NIRA, Grace Nanyanzi, Manager of Information Systems, NIRA, Dr. Sorab Gar, CEO, the Unique Identification Authority of India, Adam Cooper, Independent Identity Expert, Niall McCann, Policy Advisor, Program Manager, Legal Identity, UNDP, Kate Wilson, CEO, Digital Impact Alliance, Dele Atande, Atanda, founder and CEO MetaMe and the Internet Foundation, and Maxime Most, founding principal Acuity Market Intelligence. Thank you to all the panelists for being with us. We truly appreciate their valuable contributions to this live cast. I look forward to engaging with each of them within the different segments. Let us now start with our first feature. <clears throat> Once again, Alan, Pam, Tumello and Stefan. Thank you for agreeing to participate in the round robin roundup of the dark side of, of the trilogy. So you've attended and watched and rewatched the three episodes. And today you will briefly share your key takeaways from the trilogy. We encourage the audience to go back at some point to review these episodes 
guided by the commentary of the panelists. You will find many gems. For the benefit of the audience, let me explain what it means to run this episode as a round robin. There will be four rounds. Each panelist will have two minutes in each round to make one point. At the end of the four rounds, we will have time for community voices where the audience could join to add additional points not mentioned by the panelists. So get set to raise your hands to join the round robin for the final round. Let me start with Alan for your first point. Alan? Thank you, Joseph. And um, first, I'd like to congratulate you and the ID for Africa team on this dark side trilogy. I mean, this is an area where there are very strong and very divergent views and where um, emotions and feelings run deep. And I think the fact that you have managed to uh, arrange a respectful and substantive dialogue in this area is, is a, a wonderful thing. So uh, I think we should all be indebted to you for uh, the way you have brought this together and managed the, uh, the series. Let me start off with the first point, uh, which kind of struck me, and that's on the architecture of ID systems. Many of the, many of the points and trade-offs discussed are relating to the trade-offs between centralized systems and data and decentralized or uh, federal or uh, other kinds of systems and data with tokenized ID. For example, in um, uh, session two, we had the discussion by Jonathan Maskell and uh, Ed Whitley. And I think one that came out to me was the contrast between the centralized systems for deduplication to create a unique root identity and the use of multiple systems for authentication. And I think that this, uh, this structure needs to be thought through more carefully in terms of where countries are going in perhaps the second stage of their identity management process. That to me was a big takeaway. I should say I came away much more optimistic from the series that many of the risks that we see could be mitigated. But there was one risk that stood out to me, which is genuinely very difficult to mitigate. And that is the deep political risk that came up in the um, sessions, for example, to Carsten Maple and Teki Falconer. We talked about Afghanistan, we talked about some other countries. And I think our problem here is that it's very difficult to predict over the long term how governments and governance will evolve. ID systems are here for the long haul. And this is the one risk that I see standing out that it is very difficult to mitigate either by technology or by legal and regulatory measures. Let me stop there and thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. We'll come back in the second round to you. Pam, your turn. Yes, thank you so much. And um, Alan, plus one to those comments. So um, in looking at the trilogy several times, there is one thing that stood out to me above all other things. And this happened twice, actually. Um, in episode 23, segment five with Rosemary Kisembo at uh, Nira from Uganda. Um, and also in episode 24, segment five, the bridging the gap episode with Bridget on their access now and Hadiza Dabagan, uh, Nimsi, Nigeria. Both of these conversations um, were very courageous. I applaud Access Now and, um, and uh, Nimsi and Nira for coming to the table and having a dialogue that was productive, not defensive, and it was progressive. And I appreciated that very much. So we have a lot to learn in the identity space about how to talk with each other uh, and how to find ways of uh, creating a center around which we can find agreement. It is not necessary to have a war for this to happen. It's very, very important that we learn these skills. So um, I believe that adversarial approaches to these very sensitive matters are not always something that is productive. And so I am compelled to call on my fellow members of civil society to come to the table and to find ways of persuading and working with identity authorities and the governments and with other stakeholders to find a center and to address and, and solve the problems around inclusion that we heard throughout the trilogy. 
problems of inclusion and the political problems that Alan Gelb just mentioned are very significant. We can address these together, but I think it unlikely that we will be able to address them if we are at war with each other. We must find a way. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Uh, Tomello, your turn. Th thank you very much, Dr. Tick and uh, distinguished uh, panelists. And I think one would echo the same sentiments that um, Alan echoed in terms of um, putting together a very interesting um, episodes as countries, especially for us in Africa, as we roll out um, uh, robust uh, population registers and national identity system. But as we do that, to ensure that as we do that, as we implement this, inher there are inherent risks that we need to ensure that we have mitigating um, uh, measures in place. So for me, what came out um, as a key takeaway, especially with respect to you know part one, and that was led by uh, by by Pam, you know, um, was in the area of exclusion. Um, you know, countries are eager to put in place robust systems and ensure that they respond to the urgent need, but as a, as services are more and more linked to these systems. And we now begin to pick that the focus as um, I think Pam indicated, some of the documentary indicated that the focus is more on the technical approach and, and, and lose sight of the local context and to ensure that all uh, members of society are indeed uniquely identify, identifiable and, acts and services are, are brought to their locality and that they are not left to, to incur increasing transportation related costs to move from wherever they are to where the offices are. So for me in the part, in the, in the, in the part one segment, the issue of inclusion um, as an inherent risk you know, as we roll out the digital identity system came out um, as a key takeaway over Joseph. Thank you. Thank you, Tomello. Stefan, your turn. Yes, thank you. Plus one also to what Alan mentioned at the beginning. Thank you very much for, for this panel and the, the series. So I would like to pick up um, one point that Evgeny uh, Sirotin from IDS Labs had mentioned in episode 23, segment four. Evgeny spoke on gender and racial bias of biometrical systems and provided hard research insights. And one of his conclusions was that one, on one side, the use of these parameters is common and intuitive. However, on the other side, they will create a hazard of false positive errors based on these demographics. So this triggered the following thoughts with me, not only people or officers, but also systems can be biased. And originally humankind distrusted machines. Some said steam engines were from the devil. Just imagine where we have come today. So in the meantime, there is a tendency to trust the system more such as artificial intelligence rather than professional humans or human intelligence. And Evgeny reminded me that any algorithm is programmed by humans and awareness about the possibility of these systems failing needs to be considered. The issue is not trust, but blind trust in systems being dangerous, ranging from threats of national security over to infringement of human rights. So humans have developed to be very reliant on systems, and this becomes critical when systems are no longer just helpers, but act as decision makers. And so one aspect uh, is in border control, um, where we absolutely need constant training on the updated systems and how to interpret, such as the traffic light system, uh, traffic light um, issue with the automatic border control gates. What does green mean? Is it really green or is it just usual errors? So um, I think training of the use of machines and in interpreting what they're telling us is very important. And perhaps if I may, UNDP and IOM just issued a new guide in simple language on these topics, how to handle this. And maybe this can be a small contribution um, to constant training. Maybe Niall McCann uh, will be able to, to talk a little bit more about that later on. Okay, Stephen, thank you. Alan, back to round two, your turn. 
Okay, thank you, Joseph. Um, one other session that I thought was very interesting was the session on tests for risk. And this was the one presented by Yesha Tsering Paul of CIS in session one. It struck me while she was speaking that the uh, development community now does have a set of principles. And these principles lay out a, a general and I think a very useful framework for understanding how ID systems should be thought about, how they should be used, and many of the problems that we've discussed. But the question is, how do we go a stage deeper to understand where particular systems and where, where particular proposals fall relative to these principles? And I found it really very interesting, the concept that we can then break down these, these um, these tests, if you like, into rule of law tests, rights-based tests, and then risk-based tests. And within these have subcategories. And then this will allow us to systematize to a much greater extent than we usually do in discussion, the nature of the problematics in these various systems. And um, it was also mentioned that this has been run for several countries in Africa already. And I think Systems like this, they no, don't necessarily give you the solutions, but they provide a much better basis for a reasonable dialogue between different parties uh, so that we can at least agree on what the problems are and what needs to be done. And I think this is an area that the community could follow up uh, on uh, with more countries and trying to understand how these systematizations can help in the dialogue. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Pam? Yes, thank you. Um, plus one to Alan's comments. Um, that's one of the segments I would like to talk about. Um, but um, my my the other issue that really stood out to me what happened in episode 24, segment one. Um, Edgar Whitley with the London School of Economics made some extraordinarily um, important points about national population registries, and it led to a really robust dialogue. Um, so um, he talked about data aggregation, particularly um, uh, as it becomes more and more interoperable and what happens when the databases either do or don't talk with each other. And it's led to an entire conversation about what on earth do you do with uh, a situation where uh, there may be collection of very inappropriate data, which can be very harmful to people and groups of people later on. And it led to a discussion actually with you, Dr. Adek, in regards to should there be a do not collect provision? And if there is a do not collect provision, what would be on that list? And on the panel, there was general agreement that this would lead to a lot of difficult conversations. But I still think that we need to, as a community, sit down and have a very meaningful discussion about this. Is there data we should never collect? If that is the case, what are those data that we should not be collecting? Because we can acknowledge now that there is deep political risk that may not be able to be mitigated. With that in mind, what shall we do? And I do think we need to face this squarely and head on. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Tomello. Uh, th thank you very much, Dr. Tick. I think picking up from where Pam is saying um, was that very particular discussions between uh, good friend Jonathan from ID for Development. Um, and it's particularly addressing the very same um, issue, but looking at it from a point of view of, um, I mean, the context of data risks um, and, and various options available uh, to ensure that we mitigate that. It's particularly if you look at areas of, um, or the segments around uh, tokenization. Um, it was a very engaging and thoughtful discussions but you bring that in the context of uh, where we are in Africa, where we one we are now beginning to, as we roll out and expand on this digital identity system, we are also observing elements of um, uh, identity fraud also emerging as a result of one missing that identity card and somebody picking it 
and 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 then mis, uh, and then using that unique identifier for whatever for whatever reason. And so it, it was a very interesting discussion, but one that one had to look at in the context of Africa and say, we are crippling and are making modest progress towards ensuring that we uniquely identify our citizens. The continent is aggressively moving towards uh, implementation of free trade agreement. Central to that uh, is that unique identifier. But how do we ensure that we mitigate against the risks um, how do we, as we roll out and ensure that we derive maximum benefits that are, um, are here and ensure that we protect that, that unique identity? And then you look at the inherent um, uh, constraints uh, that we are facing as countries. So I, I thought that was very uh, interesting discussions. I think that it's one that one would like to see further discussions on it now in the context of Africa to see what we do. Here is a, a clearing risk that we are seeing. Uh, but what are the prospects of us moving towards such area as tokenization as opposed to using that unique identifier? So that was, a, that was an area that one looks forward to further discussions in it. Thanks, thanks to Melo. Stefan, your second point. Yes, thank you. So I will be referring here to segment six, episode 23 with Rosemary Kuzem, who is also with us here on the panel. Uh, from the National Identification and Registration Authority, Uganda. And she mentioned, more or less quoted, the question is not, do we need digitization and identification, but how do we address the challenges of the 33% uh, un unidentified? I thought this triggered um, my, my um, recollection of the Hitchhiker's Guide Through the Galaxy, the universal answer to the meaning of life, the universe and everything is 42. And in our field of engagement, I sometimes feel like we substitute 42 with a specific technology by jumping to, uh, to conclusions. So I feel we need to learn to ask the right questions first in order to understand what our 42 is. For me, Rosemary hit this right on the spot with her statement. And this reminded me then again of an inspirational 60 seconds pitch of Kristen Vence, who was a formal legal identity expert with UNICEF where she said, innovation for identity is not determined by the latest technology, but rather the ability to bridge the gap between what is and what could be. And I feel this challenges both leaders and industry to touch base with these 33%, leaving the realm of the well-educated and solid income and to find out what questions need to be asked. Thank you. Thanks, Stefan. We're starting the third round. Alan, back to you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Joseph. <laughs> um, Joseph, one of the sessions that I was very struck by was the one that was presented by Namati on community-based measures to reduce exclusion. And I think what that brings home to me is that we have systems, perhaps very advanced technical systems, and we have people. And many of the problems relate to the interface between the people and the systems. And I was very struck by one of the comments uh, that um, Mustafa made, uh, which was that you cannot fight digital ID, we should work with it. And then the question is, how do we work with it? And what are the prerequisites for being able to work with it in a constructive way? And I thought that the concept of data-driven advocacy was a very useful way of framing this, that you had to know something about how the system was working and how the system was being experienced by people uh, in their daily lives, whether for registration or whether for use or whatever. And then one needed a process, in their case, it was through paralegals, of empowering citizens to work with the system to remedy errors. And um, I've actually seen a very similar um, process uh, in Indonesia, an organization called PECA, which assists uh, mothers to register their children, uh, civil registration. And they do all sorts of things. They have community fairs, they have picnics, they celebrate registration, and they also provide the legal underpinning for people to be able to work with that system. 
And I thought this is also a potentially a very useful role for ID for Africa, perhaps to try and bring together organizations of this type and try and change the conversation, as Pam has said, away from warfare towards constructive engagement in this way. But this also says we need data. We need to understand how these systems are working. And we know a lot about that for some countries like India, but we know very little in most countries in Africa. Thank you. Thank you. Pam, you're third. Yes. You're third. Thank you, Alan. It's like listening to a song, a really beautiful song, what you just said. So my next um, comment um, actually is uh, about Yesha uh, Paul from CIS India. Um, this was from episode 23, segment two. She presented an absolutely stunning uh, presentation on governing ID and principles for evaluation. Alan has already talked about this. I want to take it from a slightly different angle. So the evaluation framework that Isha um, talked about, it deserves additional discussion. You know, in every multilateral I've ever seen, there's the measurement of the digital economy, measurement of this output, measurement of the SDGs. But in data governance, where are the measurements? Where are the procedures for measurements? Where's the data about if a privacy regulation works or if a protective regulation works? Where's the data? We have data on enforcement, but where's the data on effectiveness? So I was extremely compelled by the framework that CIS has built. And my, um, my question um, is, can we please expand on this? Because there were areas I would want to be in there, for example, um, more on some of the data regulatory stuff and all the things that I like uh, and I think are very important. But I think that um, a group of, uh, of, of willing participants could get together and really adapt that for identity frameworks in many contexts uh, within Africa and elsewhere. But the measurement, the possibility of measurement, I think is very, very important to pursue. Thank you. Thank you. Tomello, your third point. Yeah, no, thank you very much, Dr. Tick. I think for me, one, the third point I would want to uh, discuss is the issue that was, you know, in part three. Um, and this was presented by Dr. Benga uh, from you, you verify uh, in, in Nigeria. And uh, he was uh, discussing the whole issue of how countries um, uh, can mitigate or put in place mitigation, mitigating measures to offset the, the, prev the high prevalence of identity, identity fraud. But what was, in, what was, interesting about the, the discussion was a recognition that um, we can actually start from um, a low key approach, if you like, um, instead of running to verification in terms of biometrics. But what are other platforms or other use that we can, can we use the artificial intelligence embedded in the, in the system? together with a unique identifier, but at least have a platform that before third parties can trans, uh, perform certain transaction, then there's an ability to verify the identity of, of the client. Uh, but what was unique about it was, if you look at what is happening in, 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 in our countries is, you have all these multiple third party uh, uh, entities interested in engaging with uh, identity authorities. Um, and of course, there are issues of capacity constraint from the point of view of the identity authorities. Now, if we can now have more discussions in terms of, we may not have a middle way, that bus where everybody else go through, but if we have a platform through which multiple entities can interact and communicate with uh, identity authorities or national population registers, certainly they, the, we can begin to move towards having some form of minimum uh, measures in place to mitigate the risk with respect to identity identity fraud. So that discussion for me was quite interesting and one would, would want to look forward to having that discussion further. Okay, thank you. Stefan? Yes, so my third statement it relates to part two from uh, Tunde Okonye from Berkman Klein Center at Harvard University. And he was describing a case study of a breach of Argentina's national ID registry in September 21 with 45 million records extracted 
Um, and so this again triggered my thoughts. We still hear the discussions about physical documents versus digital credentials and playing them security wise against one another. Well, the news is physical identity documents are not absolutely secure, but neither are digital identity repositories. And the important difference to be considered is the magnitude and the impact upon a breach, which is in no way comparable, I'd say. Digitalization is the solution for many problems, but we also need to remember that at the same time, it is again, the root cause of new problems. And Murphy's law in cybersecurity is anything can go wrong, will go wrong. Um, I found some numbers, cybersecurity insurance market is expected to grow year over year by 20%, resulting to 20.4 billion US dollars by 2025. Insurance is not in our uh, realm and not uh, belonging to our solutions, but the big picture is insurance money is pouring fuel into the flames. So all of this and this uh, pitch, this example from, from uh, Tunde reminded me to be weary not only to be comfortable about answers, what is if a breach happens or can a breach happen, but to ask the question, what when a breach happens, what are our precautions and our measures? Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Alan, for the final round. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Joseph, there are a lot of segments we could talk about, but I know we have a time shortage. That's it. And oh, I'd, I'd, I'd like to go back to one of the technical sessions that I thought was very interesting. Uh, and that was the one on uh, partitioning of data and uh, encryption of data. The presentations in session three by Francis Zelazny of Anonibit and by Norman Poe of the Trust Stamp. Um, clearly, there are some new approaches towards encryption of data and partitioning of data that are coming along the pike. And um, I think these warrant, um, you know, a careful look uh, in a, perhaps a synthetic look, because they do raise some very interesting questions. Uh, it seems to me that we cannot get away from the fact that we need some centralized data in ID systems. We can partition them, but ultimately we need them. For example, for biometric images, um, do we really have an alternative but to keep raw images if we think at some stage we may need to retemplate? I think uh, any identity authority would be hesitant to get rid of basic data that it collects. And so the question of how it can be stored, managed in ways that reduce the risk are rather important. And I thought what was interesting in response to your question about what does this do to performance of the systems? For example, comparing biometrics in encrypted mode or partition mode uh, has a minimal impact on performance. And that got me thinking, what do we mean by that? And how effectively can these systems be used to protect data while at the same time not degrading the performance of the system? Would it be possible, for example, for UIDAI to use uh, partition data uh, to deduplicate 1.3 billion people? Uh, is, you know, it, that will be a challenge, right? And it seems to me maybe there's an interesting role for ID for Africa in helping to connect some of these technologies to some of the identity authorities so that we can understand using fairly large scale tests and using the data of the kind and quality that identity authorities actually have to understand how these systems working. It's not enough to do it on NIST samples. We know already that tests on NIST samples are not necessarily representative of performance in the field. So thank you. Thank you so much, Alan. Uh, Pam? Yes, thank you. It was difficult to choose the, the fourth and last um, segment, but I'm going to go uh, with episode 24. It was in a segment with Karsten Maple from the Alan Turing Institute. He talked about the transformational power of identity and ID systems. And I think we can all agree that they are transformative and the, the transformation runs the gamut, but they're very, very central and crucial. And he defined two terms that I think are worth considering more. He talked about, is it worthy of trust or is it trustworthy? So he talked about a, um, a trusted system is simply a system that a person decides to trust whether or not it's actually a good system or not. Whereas trustworthiness is a system that is worthy, as tr worthy of trust. And then his conversation went on to discuss the entire notion of identity, trustworthy identity as measurable. And I like this. 
if we can measure risk, cybersecurity does this all the time. There is very advanced threat modeling in cybersecurity. There are standards around this. We know how to measure cybersecurity uh, threat. We know how to look forward. Can we identify measures to, um, to create that kind of work in digital identity systems and trustworthiness? Can we find ways to measure trustworthiness across realms, across jurisdictions and types of systems? I think that uh, we need to fine tune this. There's very little work on this and I'd like to see more. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Uh, just for the community, if anybody wants to join the panel since we're wrapping up the fourth uh, round for the round robin, you raise your hand, we can bring you on if there's anybody interested. Uh, Tomello. Th thank you, Dr. Tatek. I think uh, for me, the, the, the final comment um, was around the discussion that you had with my good friend, my sister, um, Rosemary. Um, which was around uh, the, 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 the openness of countries to engage uh, civil society and, of course, other third party um, entities. And it was particularly important because uh, perhaps um, in the past years, there was this uh, notion or an understanding that governments do not want to open up and ensure that um, civil society understand that which government is undertaking. But of course, with the advent of the digital identity, there is, um, and I think that discussion was a fair reflection of that, which is this, um, an understanding of governments that national population register are not just meant for government, um, for, for, for national governments, but government understands that once the system is up and it's properly functioning and it delivers the necessary results, then that will be used by, you know, by other entities, including civil society, including third parties, and so on and so forth. But sometimes there is this discourse between government and civil society to say, no, we, 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 we know government will adopt a very rigid approach whenever we bring in an issue that we feel will enhance the services that government is rendering. So, so I felt um, the, the discussion uh, and, and the openness and desire and invitation by colleague uh, Rosemary to say, we are ready, we are, we are willing to sit down with you. Imagine when you began planning the, the study, we sat around the table with you, we planned the study with you, and we had members of my team around uh, with you, then we wouldn't be having this number of um, uh, people that are still um, undocumented. So I think that was a true reflection of the African uh, governments today that governments are willing to partner with civil society, are willing to work together and ensure that we achieve the common, the common goal. Good message. Thank you, thank you, Tamello. And Stefan, for your final point for you. Yes, um, episode 25, I would like to pick on uh, what Sanjay Yain, former chief product architect of Adahar, um, was speaking about. Adahar, a very broad and absolutely fascinating um, undertaking. Um, I'd like to take two items he was speaking about, to a certain extent linked to one another. The first is, he mentioned that at first there were some discrepancies in the extent of data to be collected in the place where this is to happen. So basically data minimization uh, that also Pam uh, had, to, had touched on before. Um, the second point was the considerations for federated systems. So basically the need to define the authentication of individuals on one hand, and the certification of transactions on the other, so splitting roles. And during my consulting and reviews of regulations and identity management in Africa and Latin America, I've seen particularly in the early stages a very broad extent of data to be collected, often with rather vague or adventurous use cases. And the reasoning and the rationale behind it was more or less, we want to be prepared for when we need it. So we could discuss this from a privacy perspective, but the point I would like to, to make is um, from a practical perspective, how will you maintain the data? Collecting it is easy, um, but how do you keep it current and up to date, especially if the existing registries with less information are already totally out of control? Migrating paper to systems is a very good step, but doesn't fundamentally change the challenge. And then leading over to discussing the federated systems, 
we need to have also an eye on the revenue streams, potentially in conflict with security and quality objectives. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. And thank you for the panelists for this insightful um, overview. I encourage uh, the audience to go back to the episodes and really go over them and, and listen to them and watch them. There's a lot of gems. We do have with us uh, two community um, voice members who want to join. Please introduce yourself, who you're with, and state your purpose. I start with you, John. Hello, Joseph. I hope you're well, and the panelists and also the audience. Happy to, to be in this in this uh, live cast. So I'm Jean Dubois. I'm an identity system consultant uh, in a company, new company, ID2030. And I'm basically helping government in the elaboration of their identity system, uh, mostly bridging the gap between what they need, what they can do, and what the technology can offer. So give us one point that struck okay. you. Okay, so to... I'd like to come back on, uh, on a point from part two the data, data aggregation. And uh, we got uh, Jonathan Marcel speaking about uh, tokenization. I just like to highlight how important is it to, uh, to implement this tokenization? Um, because tokenization is, is a tool, in fact, to, to be capable to take into account what already exists in a country. For example, you may be able to count with an existing uh, voter system, an existing social security system, and if you are capable to manipulate tokens, you are capable to attach the unique identity number, for example, if you have a foundational ID, to this token, so you can leverage. It's also very important because it's a law to manage privacy, to manage the right to be forgotten. So for me, I see this more uh, as an opportunity than as a, as a risk. It has, it's a risk that is to be managed, but it's an opportunity that is to be taken uh, by the government. Thank you, John, for the point. And David, you're the last point in the round robin round. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Attic. Uh, I'd like to agree with Stefan uh, Hofstetter, who said that uh, 42 is the answer. Um, I'd have to agree with that. Uh, one of the things that uh, anybody who's a technologist learns when you first start out is that garbage in is garbage out. And considering the uh, security, cybersecurity, data protection and everything else, the first thing we all should consider is um, ensuring that biometric data is accurate, certified and searchable. And I think that uh, we have to be careful to make sure that our data centers are getting biometrics that are accurate, certifiable and searchable. Um, you gotta start there, you, you gotta start with, with good data and then these other ideas of making sure that that data is uh, usable and, and secure is very important. Okay, excellent. So uh, we close this segment. Uh, thank you once again for everybody, uh, for all the panelists. And we're now ready to start our next segment, which is um, the next exciting segment, which is I on Uganda. Um, so we'll we'll allow the um, with us today we're pleased to have from Nira uh, Rosemary Kisimbo, who has been cited several times by the uh, previous panelists. Um, as, who's the executive director of NIRA, and Grace Nanyanzi, who's the manager of information systems. Uh, both of them are actually with ID for Africa as an ambassador. Rosemary is the ambassador, and um, Grace is the deputy ambassador for Uganda. So we are very proud of, of them, and we're excited to hear the uh, Uganda report where they will talk about um, their progress and the challenges that they're having, and then they will answer any questions from the community. So get ready to ask and get on the community voices as well. We're going to start to monitor the Q&A starting now. Okay, so Rosemary and Grace, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Atik, for this opportunity of featuring Uganda. Uh, please do allow me to share our presentation. I will take it in tandem with Grace. 
and uh, we each know when we come in. Uh, I wanted to first contextualize the discussion. Uganda is the pearl of Africa. Our capital city is Kampala. We have a 15.2% forest coverage, 20% rivers and lakes, 41.6 million people, and we got independence in 1962. One would wonder why I talk about forest coverage and and rivers and lakes. One, because Uganda is beautiful and breathtaking, but also we are the cradle to the River Nile and Lake Victoria and home to the big five. And we're transversed by the equator with the paradox of a snow-capped Renzori mountain. <clears throat> These paradoxes feature in digital identification and identification as a subject. The beauty of identification is also the downside of identification, but we do enjoy the beauty. So uh, the, I'll, give, I'll, I'll say a bit that such has an impact on supporting infrastructure, on the ease with which to reach people, but also is the home of where I belong. NIRA's legal mandate. NIRA is the National Identification and Registration Authority. We derive our mandates not just from our law, but also from the UN Sustainable Development Goal 16, which promotes peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development. There are three acts that are of interest to NIRA at any one point in time. That is the Registration of Persons Act, the Data Protection and Privacy Act by reason of the data we keep, the Children's Act as pertaining to civil registration. Within the government's plan for the next five to 20 years, we fall under the program of governance and security with a goal of peace, stability, and security. The policies that govern us are mainly identification, services, policy, and planning and support. Who is NIRA? And what does NIRA do? NIRA is responsible for citizen identification, registration, and ID issuance. We are also responsible for alien notification, sorry, that, that was supposed to be alien identification and registration. On the civil registration services, we are responsible for saying, hey, a baby was born and registering them. That area up on the head of the baby is saying we're getting to a point whereby we'll know in real time. We're also responsible for notifying about death or completing the life cycle of life. <laughs> That's funny. Of life to note that somebody has died and therefore has gone off our national register. It is important to note at this point that we are not yet where we ought to be because we do not, we are 41.6 million people according to uh, 2020 statistic, but we are not yet fully registered or have not received all applications. Yet, we've received 29 million applications and we have issued or fully identified 25.6 million people. We have issued 18 million cards and we are still below the 20% mark for annual birth registration, but are, are, are running this race in a fairly steady manner, looking to register at 25% this year. And uh, death registration is still really low, envisaged at 2%.
As an organization, we are present in 117 administrative units instead of the 146. In the 34 administrative units or districts where we are not present, citizens are served from parent districts, which is often far and expensive for the ordinary citizen. The bright side is we are present in 76% of the administrative units. The dark side is that we are not present in 24%, and yet every single person in the 24% bracket also needs easy access to identification. Uh, do tell me if I'm too fast or when I'm too fast, do feel free to interrupt and say, please take it a bit slower. Now this segment, I think nobody would do it better justice than Grace. So Grace is going to take an in-depth look at our processes and our services. So Grace, go for it. Thank you very much. And thank you uh, to everyone that is attending this segment. Now, Nira, as uh, Rosemary has mentioned, is spread in um, around one, uh, 112 districts, though we have 117 registration centers. Um, the process to register someone for national ID begins at what we call enrollment when you're collecting data. So at this point, we collect uh, we collect both bio data and biometrics at the same time. That data is moved <clears throat> at, at the level of uh, enrollment. You're also able to update your data. We uh, some some are corrections, uh, some are changes to uh, information names and and so on. And at enrollment, you're also able to replace your lost card or damaged card. So once this information is captured, and this can be for, for either children or adults. So for, for the children, we do not issue a national ID card, a physical card, but we assign them a national identification number, which we refer to as a NIN. So they, <coughs> um, we interface with them at this point. And, um, but the other service we offer is uh, what we call third party integration or third party interface. These are APIs that enable third parties, external institution, private and uh, government to be able to verify the, ident the identities we issue, but also those that are um, that are uh, enabled or allowed by the law to access information in the register, we also enable them to access through what we call the third party interface. Um, um, Rosemary has mentioned about the death registration. So when we register this death, we don't stop there. We also cancel the register, change the status of this person in our, from the register um, so that they, they, uh, they just a way of updating our data, but also enabling those that use our data to be able to know who is still alive and who was uh, gone. And we also register, uh, um, we are meant to register alien registration. We are, we are soon embarking on this process. So once we are able to do all this, we'll be able to capture and register all Ugandans and legal, and legal residents in our country. So we, we hope we should be able to do that. As I mentioned, we do not give cards, plastic cards to the, to the children, those that are below 16 years. But once they clock 16, we require them to come back, update their information, and then we are able to print for them a card. They don't only update biometrics, but we, we also, because we, uh, the information we collect, we share it with, many agencies, but the key one is electoral commission. So we also update their voting information so that they don't have to go and register for voting. They pick their preferred voting area and then they, they will find the data on the voters register later. So this information, once it collected, we carry out the duplication 
to central duplication systems as, uh, as central systems. So central we carry out the duplication and we are able to assign unique numbers. Uh, thank you. So as I said, we, we register Ugandans and we all citizens and we also re register legal residents. How do we identify that this one is a Ugandan and this one is a legal resident or an alien? Because we lack the, the foundation uh, um, register, proper foundation register. When you refer to Rosemary's presentation, she talked about the levels, birth and death registration where we are at. So that's why we are not able to depend on birth re uh, registers for national for identification fully. The majority do not actually have birth certificates. We are trying to clean up that so that we are able to to link the two registers. Uh, so right now we our law um, if requires that if one of your parents is actually is a Ugandan you qualify to become a Ugandan. So we require you to have a national ID, one of your parents. And those that, uh, that do not have living parents, I know um, civil society will, uh, will be on us here, thinking that we are not catering for all. So there are ways also. So there are Bannon children, we register them by working closely with police. But also those that living with their guardians, the, we, we, um, <clears throat> the way our citizenship is derived is you can, it's linked to your grandparents or your uncles. So your close relatives, we are able to, to tell that you're actually a Ugandan. But just to be sure, we also involve the local councils, our village local councils in this uh, proof of, um, uh, citizenship and our internal security. So those that are not Ugandans that acquired citizenship through registration, uh, we require them to have the certificate of registration for our sister agents, the one in charge of citizenship. And uh, that's all we require. We're able to verify them, then, then we are able to, to add them on the register. Um, so the, the process uh, starts. It's as as I said, we have I, we we carry out identity duplication, but we also verify citizenship. So, just in case we reject your application, you can actually have a way of appealing to what we call an identification committee to put your case forward, to prove that you're actually a Ugandan and you deserve to have a national ID. So once, once you prove that, we are able to add you on the register. If you're not satisfied with the decision of the identification committee, you can appeal to the high court. And then the, 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 the court the, can take up the process and then we take whatever decision that is made, Nira will consider to add you or uh, remove you from the register. So any issues to do with registration, there are ways to handle them. It's not, we don't close that door. So um, we are lucky. I know so many countries don't have both mandates, don't do identification together with civil registration. As in India, we are so lucky. We have the role of civil registration and we also do identification as well. So we've started the, we initially, when we started registration in 2014, we started registering those that were 16 years and above. That time we were looking at having um, a clean voters register. 
with biometrics. So we used it as a chance to create an identification register, but also share the same data with the with the with our electoral commission to be able to generate a voters register. And just a background, those that don't know about the story, at that time in 2014, we rolled out 18,000 registration kits, entire country at the parish level. So we're able to reach people in their homes, register them, and then we, we were able to print cards. Or we used to print 90,000 cards a day. So the, the personalization center and identification center, the duplication center operated 24 hours in a day, 24 hours, seven days a week. So uh, we're able to print and, and uh, print uh, 14 million cards, polycarbonate cards in a period of five months. <clears throat> And I think those that have seen a report about the World Bank, they talk about this, how successful the project was. Um, the service model, <coughs> we, you feel, uh, we, we provide uh, our applicants with forms. At, uh, we try to reach them. Right now, our services are at the district level. However, we try, um, uh, we schedule what we call outreaches where we are able to reach the, the people in their parishes at the sub-county level. So they are able to fill the, the registration forms and then for national ID, but we also collect information on birth and death. We work closely with Minister of Health for notification. They notify us with the births and deaths that happen in the health facilities but we also register those that happen in the community because the biggest percentage of our, of our births and deaths still happen okay. in our homes and gardens. So we, we are required to register this, but all this information is collected from the parishes and villages and brought to our district offices where we fully register uh, these events that happen. So I would like to uh, take this opportunity. Thank you, Grace. Thank you for that. Yeah. So it's within the context of our country, our country is 236,000 square kilometers. And we have 10,594 parishes and 76,000 villages. So the, the, the reach of the country is big with a, in, in a internet penetration of 24%. And the reason I'm giving these statistics is for some of the questions that are coming up whereby they ask, uh, don't, have you mastered, have you managed, are you thinking of contactless ways of gathering data? The contactless ways are also underpinned by supporting infrastructure like internet, re, internet penetration, like literacy, like cost of internet and budgetary issues. But let me go to the uses of our ID. Our ID has widely been used for in the financial sector and has brought confidence as a single source of truth in opening a bank account and a mobile money account. So financial institutions are finding comfort in the fact that there's one single source of truth where they can find detailed and complete information on an individual. It has also improved our rating in uh, international protocols like anti-money laundering and other things that require uh, proper identification of persons. Our ID is also used to support certain gut health uh, health services uh, and government services that are offered free of charge. The biggest role our ID has played is an identification system is in the voting realm. And actually the first time the mass enrollment happened, it was triggered by, an, uh, by a voting process and there was a need to improve the ways of reducing persons voting more than once. And we have played a critical role and been able to answer some pertinent questions under this realm. 
Our ID has played a critical role in public service verification and weeding out of ghost employees. In the first major uh, public service verification, um, the identification system saved government up to $50 million. Our ID has also played a critical role in, uh, sorry, I can't quite see my own presentation, in tax identification and other related services. And what are our challenges? Our ch challenges include, I just gave you a statistic of the coverage of our country, but I would like to give you another statistic. For every 50,000 unregistered Ugandans, Nira has one star. I don't think I need to belabor, to belabor that point further. <laughs> um, Secondly, is we have 10 year old technology and you know, technology rapidly changes every four months. As a result that the card production equipment and software and our enrollment software is 10 years old has an impact on service delivery and reach. We are currently in an exciting phase of ideation for our next ID. So it's a good time to begin the discussion of what we can do differently even with our civil society partners. And I want to take this opportunity to invite our civil society partners that this is a good time to give input on what our next generation technology processes and systems and human component need to look like. Because we will be speaking into another 10, 15, 20 years. So, Rather than wait for it to end and we come up with the, what could have been done differently, this is a very good time for ideation, conceptualization, and suggestion for in the face of both technology, uh, service centers, processes, simplification, and customization. Like any other uh, government agency, we have a funding gap. I just used the illustration of, of a pivot to show <laughs> that many times the unfunded priorities are far outweigh the funded activities. And I'll give a small example. A district will receive the equivalent of 300 liters of fuel for a quarter. That district will have a, re a radius of up to 200 kilometers. I will leave the mathematicians to do the mathematics on how many times a district registration officer and the staff can effectively reach out to an unreached population. And there is a role that we have also not played very effectively, and that is sensitization and engagement. I'll give an example by the questions that we are receiving in the question and answer. Somebody asks like, what do I need for a replacement? That is a sign that we have not been adequate in sensitizing and engaging the public. It's driven by a number of factors, some, are within our control. For example, there are simple things that we can do to turn around our sensitization and engagement, but some are driven by our, as I said earlier, supporting infrastructure and also the cultural diversity of this country. There are probably over 100 dialects in the country and uh, very few spoke, uh, languages spoken across and a region effectively. So sensitization to, needs to be personalized to a level that captures each dialect and respects the culture of that dialect. Because it's one thing to say you need, to, it's one thing to understand what identification sounds in each language setting and dialect.
Now, this is an exciting topic that I really, really want to talk about. In the next two years, NIRA will be handling a new mass enrollment and registration, and hopefully streamlining it with better coverage than the current coverage of 63%. What has occasioned the next generation ID? I'll mention two points. One, there is a desire to, we've had the cry of our civil society concerning the lack of fingerprint for certain trades and for some persons, for some people by gen genetically have a weak fingerprint. So we wish to add identification biometrics to our current register. That is in, in response to the outcry of the 1 million or so people who may not have fingerprints on the register. I need to mention at this point that even without fingerprints, we register your face and use it and mention so that there was no fingerprint. The risk with this is that the failure rate for similarity in face is higher than the failure rate or margin of error for a fingerprint match. So the second thing that has driven the next generation ID is by law, an ID will expire in 10 years. And why? The question and the fundamental question everyone is asking is why must an ID expire? I take this opportunity to emphasize that the card material will expire. However, the, the NIN or the national identification number, the unique identification number does not change. However, the polycarbonate material on which we print the ID progressively loses its security features over time. That means by the period of 10 years, the security features have deteriorated to a point whereby they are not of use for validation and verification. Just think about it like the security features of money. Uh, the more you use the, the money, the, 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 the loss of the security features will, will, will increase with time. So what are the principles that will guide this registration process? And I think this is something that uh, another place that I would like to invite our partners, not just across the globe, but within our civil society, who know the pains of the population, to give us their feeling, their thoughts on what principles should drive the next mass enrollment and the next mass registration. But fundamentally, we, we seek to address sovereignty and self-determination or independence. And why? Why is this important for NIRA? NIRA currently has a vendor locked system and that has had its impact on our ability to change and adapt to the needs of the population. So we are looking to owning a minimum of 51% intellectual property, but best case scenario, 100%. Inclusion and trust. The scrutiny that NIRA is under for lack of inclusion has driven us to identify this as a principle that will guide the next mass enrollment. This scrutiny on our part has driven improvement. So we have an ambition, we have a desire to do an 100% or adopt technologies that are simple, customized to our environment and will support 100% inclusion. This means a couple of things. One, to cut on the backlog, we are looking at technologies that will capture the identity of a person as close to birth as possible, notwithstanding, at least within the first year of birth during their six immunization visits. By so doing, it, it creates, it reduces the number of persons who are not identified over time. And we are hopeful that the mass enrollment exercise will ha have a huge reach as we will go further down to the lowest administrative unit, which is a village. 
The other principles that will guide biometrics and their mass enrollment exercise are national and data security. We're getting into a phase where the global environment is highly digitized. I, I like the first segment, they talked ex extensively about the risks and opportunities that digital identification presents. Um, in light of a technology giving a real-time instant access to information, we will try to look at <clears throat> extensive measures to protect data of nationals and security of the country. Another principle that will be at the heart of this 2024 is interoperability, scalability, and flexibility. I'm aware that we do not have a technical audience, but allow me to say, we seek that our system will easily speak to other systems without requiring them to adopt additional or expensive technologies to receive, update, and exchange data with NIRA. What are the biometric features that we are thinking about? I must say that this is still an area, <coughs> excuse me, that is at the heart of our discussion. We are thinking of, we already have fingerprints, to the fingerprint we'd like to add the iris scan and others that are proposed within our law. And to that we would like to add, oh, we already have the face, <laughs> already have the face. So 2024 is an exciting year for us because 15.8 million cards will expire. So we are going to take the opportunity to reach out and get our act right. Hopefully, we will look for improvements and we, will, we are in a, at an exciting phase of ideation. And again, once again, I invite our partners to join us at this stage. So this is my last slide. We have near our office. We are, we'll, go to the, we'll be at our offices, we'll be at the villages, and we'll be at the health centers. Thank you once again for the Thank opportunity. You. I will take questions. Thank, Thank you, Rosemary and Grace, you both have been doing a wonderful job answering the, the direct questions. Um, so I, I invite everybody to, to actually read some of the answers that you've made. I'll just use one of the questions that was not answered, um, which had to do with the uh, cards that were printed, but were not collected. 2.6 million sounds very, very high. Have you looked into why that is the case? It was driven by a, a number of factors. One, the migratory nature of our population. Uh, that at that time, the technology tied the, the, the receiving of the card to the geographical location at which you enrolled. So that there's a bit of a technology hitch, but there is also another feeling within the population of at, at the beginning of the enrollment exercise, people did not envisage the central role that identification would take. Mm. So and that, that is another issue. I, I, I would blame it on ourselves. We, we did not adequately sensitize the population on the importance of the exercise they were doing. Yeah. So they, they have a, a national ID card, but it's not... Yes being picked up. Do you have an address or a mechanism for you to reach out to these people instead of them coming to you, going to their house and say, by the way, are you so-and-so? Are you aware you have a card? You didn't pick it up? Yes. At our districts, they make occasional outreaches to parish and village level with cards and say, look, I have this card. And there's now they've actually now taken it to a level of the village governance and administration, whereby they call the leaders of the villages and say, 
Do we still have this person in our population? Do you know this person? Their card is registered to your village. Do you know where they could have moved to and right. subsequently right. agree on a day? Okay, that, that's definitely good. Um, anybody wants to join the community voices for one final, we're running out of time, but there are lots of questions, actually over 20, over 2000 questions, but luckily um, Grace and Rosemary have been answering them, hopefully to the satisfaction of, of the attendees. I invite everybody to, to, to read the, the answers that have come, come across. Um, anybody wants to join the community voices before I close the segment and move on to segment three? Um, I suspect uh, we don't have community voices. So let me, um, oh, sorry, there was a question that came in, uh, which I think we should take uh, live. It says, in the transition when old cards expire in 2024, what plans will be made to ensure that citizens retain access to services, recognition, et cetera, in various aspects of life in a possible interim period, especially concerning when capacity is so low? Okay. I, I, I earlier emphasized that the card will expire, but the NIN or the unique identification number will not expire. Third party access to the same will, rem will remain throughout the transition period. Okay, so it's just replacing the physical uh, evidence um, of the card. Okay, so once again, thank you, Rosemary and Grace, for this fascinating overview of Uganda and where you stand in your identity ecosystem and the challenges that you face. Um, I'm sure we'll be hearing from you again. We do invite civil society. We did, we did extend an invitation to them to join, uh, but they preferred to join in a, in a future episode as the conversation evolves between you and them. So um, we wish you all the best and we look forward to seeing you again real soon. Thank, thank you. you, Dr. Atik, for the opportunity. And thank, thank you. you, the voices that watch and listen to us. Thank you. Thank you. We're now ready to start our centerpiece panel on deconflicting the many notions of digital identity. Before I bring to the stage the illustrious panel, I'd like to make a few remarks to motivate the session and set some expectations. Let me first address the timing of the segment. You may have noticed that recently mainstream interest in digital identity has been accelerating, but also there is a growing confusion about what is exactly digital identity. The notion is most certainly evolving. A few years ago, digital identity was mainstream simply meant logging credentials such as username and password. Over time, more factors were added to the basic digital credentials to enhance trust, which added confusion. Undoubtedly, you have also heard a lot recently about the alternative digital reality or the so-called metaverse which is a virtual world where people can meaningfully socialize, work, and play. To exist in this world, we are told we would need representations of ourselves that embody our agency, or using older terminology, we would need avatar versions of ourselves. The developments that are making such a world possible are not just commercially viable virtual reality hardware. They are more profound than that. It's the convergence of solutions to multiple issues that are prerequisites for meaningful social, legal, and economic interactions in a virtual world. These include developments for protecting digital property rights, digital assets, non-fungible tokens, NFTs, and dematerialized mechanisms to finance and trade them through cryptocurrency and distributed ledgers or blockchains. So, the ingredients necessary for the emergence of a virtual reality where humans can have meaningful interactions is on the cusp of being within reach of everyone. And the augmented reality hardware necessary to enter that universe is rapidly developing and may even include built-in biometrics by default for continuous identity authentication from the get-go. Soon, such a parallel universe may even include virtual coordinates similar to a permanent address that you can claim as your residence in the metaverse. Is this high? Is this really happening? Is this the successor to the mobile internet which has revolutionized the way we work and live already? 
can we afford to ignore the massive creative potential underlying this alternative reality? Whether you are a skeptic or a believer, it's not difficult to see that such a world is going to require a trustworthy digital identity layer as the foundation of its infrastructure. What is this new digital identity? How can it be asserted? Who issues it? And who has the authority to endow it with trust? These are just some of the inevitable questions. But actually, the situation is more complex than this. Digital identity in the virtual world cannot operate in a closed system if it is to represent our agency. Government regulators would insist on some sort of link between our virtual and our official or legal identity. But will it be a unique digital twin of our physical identity? Or will the virtual world allow for multiplicities of digital identity? Before the metaverse became a hyped buzzword and the need for identity in it started to become real, governments around the world were working already towards giving official identity in digital form to all their people. Originally, this digital identity was driven by the need to improve security and it was synonymous with providing the population with smart ID cards. It was the era where official digital identity was even referred to as electronic identity. Then more recently, with the advent of digital transformation, the concept of digital identity evolved beyond smart cards to a unique identifier or a set of identifying data that can be verified over the cloud. Aadhaar, the world's largest official digital identity program, demonstrated the power of such scheme, especially within the development context. Today, this concept, while it's still a core pillar in the ID4D agenda, appears to suffer from potential negative consequences of centralization. Even before the metaverse, the user-centric community was pushing for more decentralized mechanisms. They argue that decentralized self-sovereign notions of digital identity are more in line with human rights, liberties, and privacy, and promise to give people better control over the growing data that's becoming part of their digital identity. In just a few minutes, we have evoked over five notions of digital identity, and we can continue. But it suffices it to state that once we depart from the traditional view of government exclusively enrolling and credentialing people, we find ourselves in a very rich and nuanced new world where there are many different possible and potentially acceptable notions for digital identity that go way beyond the simple digitization of our legal identity. And they all merit to be explored. And this is exactly why we have organized this forward-looking panel. The objective is not to try to find a preferred notion for digital identity. That may not be meaningful, but to explore the different ones and to understand their consequences and the potential connections among them and the context within which each is most adapted. This is the purpose of this panel. And I'm very pleased to have with me an illustrious group of experts to explore this topic together. So without any further ado, let us bring the panel with us today are Dr. Saurabh Garg, the CEO, the Unique Identification Authority of India, Adam Cooper, Independent Identity Expert, Niall McCann, Policy Advisor, Program Manager, Legal Identity UNDP, Kate Wilson, CEO of Digital Impact Alliance, Dele Atanda, Founder and CEO of MetaMe and the Internet Foundation, and Maxime Most, the Founding Principal, Acuity Market Intelligence. Thank you, panelists, all for being with us. Very pleased to have you in this session. Um, just to make sure we've got everybody. Yes, we've got everybody. Okay, um, I want to begin to, by trying to explore the diversity of notions of digital identity. I want to start with government and development agencies, then we'll bring in industry and civil society. Um, to get us started, I'll ask the same leading question to sort of kick us off to, to the experts. For, for this question, the order will be, I'll start with Dr. Um, Dr. Garp, and then Adam, Niall, Kate, Deli, and Maxime, who will provide us as we go along with an ever enriched and, and multi-perspective view on the question. 
So, um, Dr. Gard, let us start with you. You represent the largest digital identity program in the world. What notion of digital identity do you or your organization work with today? So, in other words, what is your definition, operating definition of digital identity? Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Artik. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here, and I look forward to this discussion uh, with the other colleagues on the panel. Uh, as far as digital identity is concerned, uh, as you mentioned, Adhar, we already have issued uh, 1.3 uh, billion uh, uh, digital identities or Adhar uh, numbers, as we call it. Uh, for us, uh, the digital identity is the basis for a person to be able to identify themselves, whether it's before a government or whether it is to receive a particular benefit from the government. The focus has been on uh, being able to uh, uh, identify yourself and which in itself is very empowering because a lot of people uh, before the advent of Aadhaar did not have uh, a document or a method to prove who they are. So Aadhaar has given such a mechanism that a person uh, supposing uh, a person says, I am X, Y, Z, uh, you can actually uh, verify whether that person, what that person is saying is true, either offline or online. Uh, we have both mechanisms available. We have a QR code, which is an encrypted QR code, which is available in the paper form on the identity. But a card or a digital identity is not necessary because a person can... Uh, use the 12 digit number, which is what identifies uh, the digital identity, a number as it call, it's called an Aadhaar number. And that Aadhaar number, a 12 digit number can be verified using a fingerprint, using an iris scan, or using the face as a biometric. And a person can confirm the name, the gender, the date of birth, and the address of that person. So we've uh, the card is an addendum. It's if people want some physically to see something, but it's not necessary. So a digital identity for us is a means, I would put it simply as a means of empowerment of uh, especially the vulnerable and the poor who previously did not have access to a passport or a driving license or any such thing. So, so it's basically... Um, a government-issued number, which can be verified um, over the cloud or offline using credentials that you enable, uh, either digital credentials that have been printed out or credentials that are available via the cloud. But it is a centralized role for the government. I mean, is it, it's the role of the government to identify the people. Uh, uh, yes, uh, the data is uh, centralized. Uh, because we have biometrics of 1.3 billion people of the country. Uh, so uh, biometric is uh, a data that uh, access to that biometrics is only through trusted partners, uh, because obviously we are very uh, concerned about the cybersecurity and the confidentiality of this data. So access is only through a set of uh, trusted partners. We have a number of partners, both in the government and the private sector, uh, through which uh, one can access this uh, after passing, obviously, a number of firewalls, etc. And that is why we have this offline verification system that a person can take a printout uh, themselves through the portal of their identity, and it has a QR code, which is also encrypted, and that QR code reader, it's available in the uh, in the Apple Play Store or the Google uh, Store. So you can download that uh, QR code reader and you can use that encryption to confirm whether that person is actually uh, that person. So uh, the data, the biometric data is centralized, but the demographic data is available on a QR code, which is available with every person if they so uh, desire. Okay. Thank you. Hold on to that thought. I will will no. will come back to this discussion. Adam, let me come to you and let's try to understand how do you see the notion of digital identity evolving? You're working with lots of governments and you've been ad advising them. Um, where where do we stand with digital identity? Yes, thank you, Jeff, and uh, thank you for inviting me to speak today. Yeah, I, I think it's very important to 
bear in mind that digital identity, if we're talking about digital identity, is a means of identifying yourself through some kind of digital medium, whether that's through a mobile device, whether it's online, whether it's some kind of technology device. But it can be used both online and offline. Um, so that's a very important thing to notice. But the point of it is to identify who you are. One of the really interesting things moving forward is that for most transactions, that's just simply not good enough. Knowing that it's Adam is kind of useful. And knowing that to a level of trust is also very useful, particularly when we think about the appropriateness of what we're doing. So how much do I want to reveal about myself? What's appropriate for me to actually do in this situation compared to the transaction I'm trying to complete? So I may only reveal certain elements about myself, which might not include a unique identifier. It might simply confirm that I'm a real individual and that I'm a citizen, perhaps, or that I'm a, or something like that. But the really important thing to know is that most transactions actually want to know far more about you. They want to be able to satisfy questions like, am I eligible for the service or the payment or the thing I'm trying to do? Can I be authorised to complete that transaction? And those are only satisfied by knowing other things about me, so trusted data about me as an individual. Which means that from an identity point of view, it's more important in most cases to reveal that trusted data and that I'm a real individual and that that was issued by somebody you trust rather than just giving you my name, my national identity number and my date of birth, for example. So a lot of governments now are looking towards how do we enable individuals to get access to the rich data that governments actually hold about them? So we, we heard um, Rosemary um, earlier talking about all the great things that Uganda do and other governments do as well for registering just life events for individuals, births, deaths, marriages, the fact that we have healthcare, the fact that we are employed, the fact that we are claiming pensions, that we are attending school. All these things are important information about individuals, our right to vote. And we only need to reveal certain elements of that to be able to do things. And putting that in control of the individual is also really useful. It's also great for inclusion because if we can enable governments to use that rich data to verify the identity of individuals as well, that allows us to include much greater uh, elements of society who wouldn't normally be able to participate in digital identity. Okay, so basically for you, digital identity is actually a, a, a a much broader concept, which includes a lot of data about you, hopefully under your control. And hopefully yeah. that is context specific. You release it depending on the context. Um, Niall, do you see a confusion uh, that could emerge from the concept of digital identity and credentials? What, what do you see uh, as, as sort of the, the issue here with, with these notions of digital identity? Clearly, um, in, in some cases, what you're authorized to do is something that I would consider as a credential. Um, my foundational identity, which is what you as a UNDP, uh, as the legal identity agenda of UN, would argue should be sort of purely I exist and I'm unique. So, so talk to us about your, your on vision of digital identity and its relation to legal identity. And also, how do you see this? fitting with credentials, which I think Adam talked a little bit more about digital identity from a credential perspective. Mm. Thanks a lot, Joseph, and greetings to everybody. And yes, you're absolutely right. You, and let's be clear, everybody on this, not just on this panel, everybody participating today has probably multiple digital identities. I have at least 30. I probably have many, many more. And I'm not just speaking about login details, usernames or passwords. I'm talking about email addresses, social media profiles, etc. that all exist as separate 
uh, digital identities. But when we speak of the term digital ID, I think the community understands that to, to be digital identity document, i.e. legal. It is an official identity with which you can assert and claim your rights as a citizen um, to be able to interact with public services and government services. And yes, in the UN, we feel it is very, very important that that digital ID that is issued to adults, and as we've seen uh, in Nira's case here, excellently managed, we feel that this should be linked to the core act of birth registration and linked to the, the core life event of death registration. We do not think it is good if there is no link with death registration so that digital ID databases end up with millions and millions and millions of dead people, more and more dead people in the system every day. We feel that public confidence in the integrity of the identity system is then damaged by knowing that there are so many dead people still floating around uh, in the database. And we also feel it is probably inevitable, although admittedly, this is more anecdotal than, than in terms of real data. But we do feel it is very, very likely that if governments invest more and more money in the core adult-based digital ID database, that may mean less and less money for the core act of birth registration. It will also make for major uh, political challenges possibly if teenagers are trying to enter a digital ID database at the age of 14 or 16 or 18, if there is no way to trace their identity back to birth and confirm who in fact uh, uh, they are. So we would like to see uh, a person being born, having their birth registered, and then from that point on, that person being empowered to assert and authenticate their own identity in a digital manner that links back to, uh, to their birth registration. That's pretty clear. The question, Joseph, where it gets really complicated, I feel, is where some countries, quite rightly, to be honest with you, can have completely separate databases and systems for issuing, for example, passports, driving licenses, national ID cards, where in effect you can end up in a, in a situation where any individual has multiple official digital identities. And the question then becomes, is one of those identities the primary identity? Is one of them an identity above all identities, one identity to rule them all? And if I can say one more thing about a coming uh, 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 something coming down the track, I think is fundamentally important here. We are very, very close in the next five to 10 years for many, many countries around the world to start issuing central bank digital currencies. They're doing this for many reasons, one of which is to combat the growth of cryptocurrency and to manage uh, the money supply. I simply cannot imagine that if governments are going to start opening accounts for people, for individuals, at a central bank and have governments send money to that digital ID wallet that is held for them at a central bank. I simply cannot imagine a scenario where that identity, one where the individual directly um, interacts financially with the government can exist alongside other identities such as passport databases or, or driving license or separate social security databases, et cetera. It suggests to me that governments are going to be strongly trying to centralize identity systems even more. Whether that's a good thing or not, of course, is a, is a question for much debate. Actually, hold on to that thought. You, you touched on a couple of points that we would like to get the panel in the second round to comment on. One is the basically the uniqueness and, and the hierarchy of the digital ID. Is there a digital ID to rule them all? Um, or actually, we could have multiplicity of digital IDs. And, and also, you touched about the who um, issues these digital IDs. Um, you mentioned the, the important role of the government. So, um, Kate, um, give us your perspective on, on what's been discussed so far and also on some of the options that you, you think um, could be pursued in developing a notion for digital identity. Thanks so much. Um, and I, I actually want to pick up on Niall's uh, comments because I, I think it's a sort of 
big segue to this. So partly what he's describing is a process in which every country on the planet is going through a digital transformation journey. Digital ID is at the heart of that digital transformation and needs to be, there needs to be some minimum element as Adhar has done and Sarah eloquently described as Niall is talking about and saying, you know, there's a foundational element that is linked to CRVS that says you are who you say you are. And then each system that is attached to that, that exists, somebody's right to vote, their ability to tie into health, their ability to access education or agricultural services or financial and banking, but then likely to be tokenized systems that are in place. I wanna go back to something that Rosemary and Grace said and talked about quite eloquently as did the first panel. And is that we're often having these debates about just ID or we talk about just the tech or we talk just about privacy. We've got to break this approach and say, this is actually about a national digital transformation journey. Digital ID is a fundamental first component that is at its heart. And as we do it, we need to talk about the products that are available and how you kind of roll them out in a crawl, walk, run way. So you don't look for some sort of big bang approach, but you look for something that actually can be afforded and rolled out now that will work for the next 10 years and can be built upon because Rosemary and Grace were 100% right. It's going to change constantly. And you are going to have new threats all the time. So there's the product side. And you need to bring in the policy at exactly the same time so that you're constructing the, the trusted digital identity that ties to your CRVS systems at the same moment. So your policy discussion is taking place at the same time that you're having this discussion about the future. And we talk a lot about the people. We kind of say, yes, we need people in capacity. But her point of one to 50,000 is, is not a minor one. If you're going to really deal with cyber security threats, if you're really going to deal with the complexity of AI and what is internal biases in these systems, if you're really going to manage a system, not just roll it out, but manage it over the next 10 to 15 years, you've got to invest more in the people who are helping roll this out and their engagement back with the citizenry to enable that kind of trust. And the last, and the one we never really talk about, so I'm just going to say it, is actually it's the procurement of these. Like we have the procurement systems to actually get these in place and how bias gets built into systems sometimes in the procurement side is something that I think we need to tackle as these new systems are going in. Um, but I couldn't agree more with Niall's points. Okay, so great. So we're going to come back to these. Um, Dele, you have um, a, you, you, a different, a little bit slightly different perspective looking at identity as an information asset. Um, broaden our horizon with this notion and let us understand how MetaMe, for example, and the Internet Foundation views digital identity. Yeah, you know, I, I think um, what's clear to me and through the Internet Foundation, I, I look at this from the perspective of digital human rights. And when I look at the principle of digital human rights, I think that our, certainly our approach with the Internet Foundation is that we can improve human rights through digital technology. And I think that's an important context because I think as I listen to the conversation today, it dawned on me that actually digital identity isn't just changing our notion of what digital ideas and, and digital transformation. It's changing our very perception of what identity is. And I think this is the context that we need to look at this from. I think there's a lot of confusion in between the concept of identity and the concept of identifiability. Mm -hmm. And for when I look at this from a human rights perspective, this is very concerning because we talk about identity like it's something objective you know it's an identity number it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a unique identifier it's a it's but it's not identity is actually really subjective it's who am i what is my nationality what do i believe in what are my political views what's my sexual orientation this is what really identity means in the modern world in that sense but what becomes important then is more about identifiability and how can I identify myself in the context of whatever 
thing that I am doing. And obviously from this, and I think what's really important in that context as well is that what we are talking about here is the fundamental unit of society, the citizen and society. How does the society, the state, recognize me and identify me and, val and validate and verify me? And how do my peers, how do I interact with my peers? Do I interact, you know, there are times when I will want to interact with my peers in, in an anonymous manner. I mean, we all walk down city centers um, and we're not compelled to tell people what our name is or give identifiable information for every transaction we have. So I think we need to kind of start to look at it in this, in this more broad context. I definitely think that government has a key role to play in providing a source of identity that is verifiable and that's very high quality and attestable. But let's be honest, I mean, we know that that's challenging for people in some parts of the world, the relationship between the citizen and the state. So we also have to have measures. I mean, there are 60 million people who are stateless in the world today. And that number is estimated to grow to 500 million in, 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 in a very short period of time. So it can't simply be about the state um, providing the sole source of truth or the sole source of proof, obviously. But I think these things aren't binary. I think they're, they're grades and that we need to be able to look at different types of identifiers and attribute different quality or ratings or scores to them accordingly. Okay, so you're basically proposing that identity management should be done within the context of risk risk management, in which case the evidence for identity could be associated with certain levels of risk, depending on the level of trust that that evidence comes with. So that's actually a subject we wanna we we wanna address. But before we do that, let me go go to Maxime. Maxime, you've heard five people already say <laughs> what digital identity is. You're always yeah. good at bringing it together <laughs> or, or pulling it apart. I prefer if you pull it apart. So let's just see. Well, I, you know, it's fascinating. I am literally, my brain is spinning trying to absorb all the information that I heard because I think it's, it's so fascinating and it's so important to um, attack this problem from so many different perspectives. You know, when I think about digital identity, I think, um, and this, it uh, reflects some of the comments that, that Kate made. I think about it as critical infrastructure for the 21st century. We just cannot function as societies or communities without effective, secure um, digital identity infrastructure. And to me, it goes back to this notion of um, asserting um, entitlements or insert, asserting access to privileges. Like that's really what this is about in this incredibly complicated world. And so I think that um, when you start thinking about critical infrastructure, it's all of those things that, that Kate was talking about. But, you know, my perspective is, you know, how do you, how do you build that in a way that's trustable, that's scalable, that's secure, that allows people to not, um, to leverage their identities, you know, again, to assert privileges or to, to um, entitlements, but not to give up their power, not to, to be subjugated to a government or to a corporation or to, you know, multiple entities. My biggest concern with a lot of, and some of this was raised in these discussions, this notion of um, sort of this, the, you know, uh, the, um, proliferation of identity, like everywhere within multiple agencies, within organization, multiple agencies within a single government, across governments, across commercial entities. This notion that our identity information proliferates from my perspective is a really bad manifestation of this critical infrastructure. So I'm really interested in really kind of understanding what does it mean to, to build uh, you know, as I mentioned, an effective, safe, secure, reliable, trusted critical infrastructure that allows us to live our lives in both the digital world and the real world without giving up our, you know, our um, sovereignty over ourselves, our, our information, our data, and so on. Okay, so I, I think 
I, I feel like you, you, you are leaning towards sort of a unique ecosystem where there are some hierarchy. Some of the digital identities are worth more than others. And maybe there is one digital identity to rule them all, which we will come back uh, in a second to. But I wanted to now sort of open up to the panel, free for all, and the discussion by sort of creating some uh, fire starters. Um, one, the first thing is the roles of the different actors and the players. So when you're talking about um, digital identity, obviously you've got the, 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 the um, uh, government, you've got the owner of the identity, you've got basically the community in which this identity is supposed to exist. I don't, it could be physical community, it could be virtual community, um, it could be other relying parties that need this. So I'd like to talk about what do you see as the, please raise your hand, uh, as the roles of the different players um, in this ecosystem? Do you, do you think there is one uh, player that has a privileged role or do you think this is an ecosystem and it's gonna settle down depending on the offer and supply and demand? <laughs> So anybody wants to take on this, this issue? Yes, Adam. I think one of the, the key and roles. Dr. Sorry. Good, good. Sorry. I, I think one of the key roles in this ecosystem, uh, and it probably echoes some of the things that, that Niall and Kate were saying, are that you need a source of trust. And governments have consistently over time been very good at being authoritative sources of trust. They do create central registers. They do have good processes that cover huge um, quantities of people. Um, and they are able to issue secure documents. They have done for some considerable amount of time. So building on that trust is very important. So governments have a responsibility to enable that trust to be part of the digital ecosystem, those authoritative sources of trust. Adar is a very good example of this with its really good coverage and the ability to uniquely identify individuals, to be able to then use that in, in other uh, credentials is really important because personally, I think we need to separate out the issuance of credentials from the trust. I think that's a very important aspect of the digital ecosystem, um, which means largely in my mind that this isn't about necessarily one uh, identity to rule them all, but it might be that there are certain trusted sources of who I am that you might trust over others. So you think the government will have a very, very unique uh, role to play in, in the digital identity ecosystem? Not um, absolutely have a, a critical role to play, um, largely because they are one of the sources of trust that we all use now in the offline world. We all understand how passports and driving license and ID cards work, and they work for very good reason, because they're easily understood. They're issued by somebody we trust, a government, with processes we understand and can reference. There are means of correcting errors that are established. There are laws that back these things up. So, so there are a lot of things behind government data sources that are really important and we, can, and we can put a lot of trust in. So enabling those to be used in other ways is really important. But I don't think it's the responsibility of governments to then move on and say, well, government X is just going to issue the credential that represents you with government X. What I think they should do is separate that out and say, well, we could do that, but we should really just enable that trust to be used in other medium. Um, okay, hold on to that thought. Um, Dr. Gar. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> I think uh, uh, <clears throat> number one is that the ownership of the identity remains with the individual. And uh, like in Adhar, we treat ourselves as a trustee uh, where the own, uh, where the identity we are, uh, we have the uh, information related to that identity. And the usage is based on a clear consent architecture. The consent of the individual is necessary before uh, this identity information that is with us uh, can be used by anyone. Uh, 
uh, we don't uh, we follow that principle of minimal data and retaining no information about transactions uh, that have been done so that uh, it's only if the individual wants certain information to be shared to be given to be utilized uh, there has to be a explicit consent it's not an implicit consent it has to be an explicit consent and <clears throat> to that extent the aadhaar is the foundational identity on which other layers of identity can be built and that's why we follow that minimal data supposing someone wants the eligibility of a program or they want certain other things then each of them whether it's a driving license or a passport or a government program they can utilize the core information available with the aadhaar ecosystem and build on that provided they have the consent of the individual to do so okay um okay uh dr gar said it perfectly i would <laughs> so a, a slightly pile on which is uh simply to say that that minimum amount uh which the government may hold but is given by the citizen and that there is a in the design of the system that there is true consent and that that consent is con constantly reinforced then provide then additional identifiable because i thought that it was a very nice distinction earlier um from uh dele different identifiable information about you then may be given as permission within subsystems that come from the national government and that are done through an exchange um the last point that i'd like to say is that you know i think india has done a wonderful job of this estonia there's a number of countries who have built this into their setup and i think the more we learn on how that relationship between the citizen giving consent to the holder of a basic foundational id and then consent systems out to other subsystems either managed by the government like healthcare or education or managed by other groups is pretty critical okay. and that relationship we need to tease out more okay uh delhi what's your perspective yeah i mean i think both kate and um dr got got um data minimization and consent foundational principles of what the government's role needs to be in terms of um provisioning 100% and i think the government as a source of a reliable um credential um very much in the lines of what now said earlier like a from birth like from birth certificate which i think is the foundational credential and then others are built on top of that are key but i do also think that it's really another important role for government is policy and because i think when you look at it effectively you have government which is the state and the citizen and the state puts the framework around how the citizen interacts with society with the community with enterprise in that regards and this is where it gets really important now because as a citizen i need to have my rights in how i not only and this is where it gets thorny because obviously there's the issue about my rights with the state but let's put that aside for a second but certainly the state needs to put in place provisions to ensure that how i interact in the community how i interact with industry is overseen by rules and principles that industry or community cannot obviate and that's what we're seeing some of the problems of today and so i think that that's a really important role for government too i think for the individual it is about sovereignty and rights and you know the principle that you're as free as you need to be until you're encroaching on someone else's freedoms i think stands in that regards um but i think that's the important thing as a as a citizen i should have the freedom to choose how i interact whether it's with my bank or whether it's with my social media platform and they also have the rights to make choices or make make rules in terms of in order for me to be able to interact with them i have to do such and such so long as it falls within the framework work of what is allowable by by legislation so i do think it is i i think to maxine's point earlier who did bring it together phenomenally well i have to say um it is critical infrastructure and the most fundamental critical infrastructure um you know it really sh should oversee the interaction between the individual the community industry and the state accordingly okay um maxine do you have something to add or i give you priority for the next one 
No, I, I would like to add something because I hate, Please. well, I hate, I say I hate to break up the kumbaya, kumbaya, but I kind of like to break up the kumbaya. You break know it, me. Break it. Well, Joseph, this is all predicated under the assumption that you can trust the government. Right. Um, this is predicated under the assumption that some kind of federalization of government is is the defined as the trusted source in the United States. That's absolutely not the case. Um, and that, you know, I think we, there's an obligation when you're talking about building infrastructure and I, Joseph and I, and others that we go, go back 20 plus years in this industry have talked about relative to biometrics is I think there's an, there's a responsibility incumbent upon the developers of this technology to minimize the ability for the technology to be used, um, in bad ways. And I think, you know, we're, we're sort of assuming that, 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 that in this conversation that yes, of course, you know, the government's the trusted source. And I, I think that's contextual and I think it's cultural. So I think we have to be careful about that. Yeah, actually uh, th there's something to follow up on that and something that Niall has always talked about in the past, which leads me to, to um, this question. And I'll give priority to Niall if he wants to take it on this one. Um, the paradigm has always been that the government um, has a, a responsibility to um, to identify people, um, but are we creating um, additional risks by concentrating in the digital world that entire power? Not used to always talk about the need to have a birth certificate in physical form, just in case the government decides in a digital form to delete you from the system. And therefore, when you create a system where the governance is, is controlled by one entity, and when that entity goes bad, is there a worry? In the physical world, I had my ID, I had some documentation, they cannot erase me. What happens in the digital world, in the metaverse, uh, if the government decides Joseph Attic does not exist anymore, delete? Um, uh, Obviously, we know there are mechanisms online um, through distributed ledgers, et cetera, to avoid the permission, et cetera. But are we opening that subject um, because we're worried that, that, that having the governance from a centralized authority is a dangerous thing? Niall, what do you think? Uh, Joseph, I'm delighted you, you mentioned that. You know, Africa has been a leader for many, many years on models of independent managing, management of elections, right? So many African countries have established independent electoral commissions, protected not just by law, but in some countries protected under the constitution where political parties, competing political parties get to nominate commissioners. And in some countries, civil society, civil society advocates get to nominate commissioners, et cetera. And in many countries, it is the independent nature of those electoral commissions apart from government that has built the public confidence in the integrity of an election. And I've been asking myself for many years, why can we not have the same system for identity management? Why can't we have independent identity authorities established under law or protected by, by constitutions that would have digital rights advocates, civil society advocates, women's groups, private sector, political parties, government ministries, all represented, but where that uh, identity authority manages identity of citizens and resident foreigners separate from centralized government ministries like ministries of the interior or police forces in some countries that are managing some national population registers. I think this is a model that we really need to explore um, an awful lot more because if you did have those type of independent identity authorities managing identity, then perhaps a lot of the fears around complete centralization of the data belonging to citizens wouldn't be so uh, pronounced, the fear of it. We're going to continue about this issue, but let me add to what you just said. The trend is going in the opposite direction right now, which is more and more of the independent identity authorities, which used to be called commissions, identity commission. Some of the names are in fact, even commission in their name has gone now into being part of a government ministry, either Minister of Interior or ICT. And when we talk about this with African countries, the argument goes back as a commission, you don't get a budget. If you are part of a ministry, you have a budget, you're able to get through. So this subject 
about the institutional arrangement. We, if we believe, and it seems like the, the panel, most of you believe that there's a central law role of governments to, to play, but that is not separate, as Nile is saying, from the institutional arrangement, because the concern is if it's just the government and if something goes bad, then you've, you've concentrated so much power in the hands of the government. So let, let's let's continue on 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 this line. Um, I actually, uh, Kate, do you wanna do you wanna pick up that thread? I'll come back to everybody. Well, I think I, I might actually have a question for Maxine, which I want to dive into. Which okay. is, I'm sort of it, but it does it does align with this thread, which is, you're right. I would say most of us feel that there is some role for the government to play, and that there is a piece of that. In, in part because the government is playing a role in every country in the world, even in the US, which does have a distributed system, but does have a number attached to it. But from Thailand to South Korea to Nigeria to every, there is, there is a minimum data element that is there simply because you are a citizen of the country. So I'm just really curious, what's the alternative when we move to the digital ID? that allows this to actually work because it, it is going to, I, I think your, your concerns and are shared, right? I have the same concerns about that. And which is why I sort of argue for data minimization. Um, but I'm, I'm curious as to what's the alternative to find where's the holder because we, have concerns about companies in the same way. We have concerns about sort of just completely distributed systems in the same way. And, and so there is that question of what's our alternative if it's not this. So I'm just curious your response. Well, I just think it has to be a combination. I don't think it's I don't think it's either or. I don't think it's centralized or decentralized. I think we have to create um, an infrastructure that supports um, some kind of you know, origin identity that, and, you know, in most places that's, that's a government function and issuing a pat and issuing a birth certificate. But I think beyond just state stating that this person exists um, and, and to Joseph's point, it's also good to have a hard copy on that in case somebody wants to delete you. But I think there's a big difference between asserting that a person exists and a person has any right or privilege or, or, you know, or access to things. And so I guess in my mind, and I'm, I, I haven't solved this problem yet. So, um, but I, I think about sort of a, a more complex ecosystem where you have, you know, some kind of, you know, proof of existence, if you will. And then a lot of the other um, characteristics um, defining PII, um, assertions of privilege or benefit are really distributed closer to the actual um, place, whether that's physically or digitally, to where you're actually going to um, assert your identity in a case to, to, to receive a benefit or a privilege. Okay. Um, you, you raised some, some very interesting points. I do have some proposal that I'm going to challenge the, 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 the panel with, but I want to hear the round um, and then I'll come back. Um, Dr. Garp and then Adam and then Dede. Yeah, I just wanted to say that along with the, uh, the consent, I think this issue of privacy is very important and it's uh, critical that Mm, uh, it's, 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 it's a, as was mentioned, a kind of a national law uh, which takes care of issues or fears of use of data for surveillance by the government. So I think that needs to be built in into the uh, into the privacy uh, framework, uh, which is either part of the constitution or the statute under which uh, uh, the, such an authority would exist. And uh, if there are uh, safeguards, checks and balances which are built in, I think these kind of fears uh, could be addressed but they need to be addressed. I think uh, uh, that, that's a very fair statement to say. Okay. Um, Adam? I, I think one of the things that we need to remember about all this is that identity itself is, has so many different facets. It, it's not simply about how I prove something about myself, whether that's using a government data source or not to prove who I am. And it might actually be multiple 
to go to Maxine's point in the UK, my country, we don't have a central ID database either. But we do have lots of interactions with government. I have interactions with the taxation authority, with the driving license authority, with the healthcare authorities, all sorts of aspects across government, so much data, plenty of opportunities to correlate that and to figure out who I am. So government data is not going away. They're, they're also not going to stop providing us with services or issuing official documents or registering births. Those things are just going to continue. Um, and we're not going to replace them by something else in the near future. So they will exist as means of proving who we are, but it's way more than that. And we're starting to touch on some of these things now, which is really important. Only one small part of it is proving who I am. There are lots of other aspects about how I protect that data, how I can use it, who's allowed to use it, how we represent that data in a safe way, what a credential actually means. I mean, we're using credential interchangeably here, even as experts, where you could use the word credential to mean a passport or an ID card. I, I could use it to mean something cryptographic. There are so many different uses for the words that even the terminology is not solidified yet. And, and as we move into the, the crazy world, world of the metaverse, it gets even scarier because I forget who mentioned it before, but one of the things that we absolutely have to deal with in this is harms. Yeah. Everybody thinks about the wonderful things we can do with technology and all the, the great things we could do. What about all the bad things it could be used for? Those very rarely get considered, and they certainly aren't being considered by the big corporations who are looking to move us towards even more digital technology and, and digital identity. They're not necessarily even being considered by governments in these situations. So I think there really needs to be that in involvement with civil society, as, as Joseph mentioned before. We need to take a step back and think about what are the consequences of doing these things that we're doing? Because that's massively important to all of this. Um, so, so I think we have to bear in mind that there are so many different dimensions to what we mean by identity that we have to be very careful about how we move forward. And, and even saying, do we trust a government or not, is problematic because if we don't trust them to a certain extent, we're not going to have voting or birth certificates or passports. Yeah. <laughs> so there are certain things we have to trust in certain situations, even if we don't fundamentally trust our own government. OK, we'll, we'll come back to this point. Delhi. Um, yeah. You know, I think um, at some, some someone said it earlier on, I think, on the first panel about the difference between trusted systems and trustworthy systems. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's really the essence of this. I think. Um, and to, you know, to Maxine's point again earlier, I think it is a very important concern about governments being bad actors, about states being bad actors, about situations where people are refugees. There are huge numbers of refugees coming out of Africa um, still today. Um, so we can't always assume that governments are bad, act that governments are good actors. Similarly, we can't assume that enterprise and corporation are good actors either. So I think in the context of trusted systems versus trustworthy systems. The, the, the term that we often use in the cryptoverse, in the blockchain space, is trustlessness. And this, the idea of trustlessness is that we need to build systems where there isn't the need to right. trust these entities, By these default. intermediaries, because the systems themselves are so robust that we can believe in the systems. And I think in, in taking everything that we've all said in terms of those combinations, because it, it is, it's about applying these different centralized, decentralized, you know, encrypted, distributed, all of these things at the right point of leverage, according to the problem that we're solving, so that we can build a model that is, that has this benefit of being trusted, trustworthy, and trustless as appropriate, um, depending on the engagement and transaction we're conducting. Okay, so I'm gonna to go to Maxime, then introduce another dimension. Kate, I'll come back to you because that dimension might engage a richer conversation with you. Uh, Maxime, do you, so do you I wanna... think 
Yeah, there's some really important points. And I, you know, I think this has been raised a couple of times. We're talking about definitions. So I think we need some new language to talk about yeah. this. I think digital identity, and you started with this, Joseph, which is it's just this broad notion and concept. And there's lots of different ways to think about it. So I think we need to think about it in terms of an ecosystem and critical infrastructure and what the components are and what the levels are and how those things interact. Because I think if we can come up with some terminology that captures some of these concepts, then it's gonna be a lot easier to create a more universal understanding and actually try to solve the problem. Yeah, okay. So along those lines, um, let us try to take a look at a framework um, which tries to democratize the role of everybody. Basically, instead of giving the government a unique role and a privileged role and therefore increase the risk, let us think of identity as basically separate from the evidence of identity and think of uh, the mechanism of enhancing the evidence of identity coming from attestations. Basically, I could be, I could claim my identity. I'd say, I am Joseph Attic, here are my claims. Uh, this could be worth nothing unless I bring in attestations. Some of the attestations could be my birth certificate because somebody attested to me having been born, okay? That could be the civil registration authority, but they are not the ones who are giving me the identity. My identity exists. It could be in a distributed, in a self-sovereign manner, but it increases its level of trust and worthiness by having attestations. My school, the, the place where I spent, you know, eight years, 10 years of my life, that could be a source of attestation that in, in, increases my community. Um, the community could come to come and say, yes, we know Joseph Ari. Um, he lived here for whatever number of years. So you create a framework, which is not binary, which says you exist or don't exist. You exist because you claim to exist, but then you allow the attestations. The government becomes one of the attestation elements. LinkedIn could be an attestation element. Um, my neighbors could be attestation elements. Um, community. And, and so to me, we have an opportunity in the digital world to maybe change the narrative. But it may be that if we're trying to just digitize the role of government and bring it into, into, into this new world, we were, are repeating the same challenges um, that, that we've had um, in the past. And then there's a, there's a question uh, which came from Jerome Couillon, which says the end game has not changed over the past 50 years. We still cannot claim that we have succeeded. I mean, we are basically repeating the, the, the paradigm. So what do you think about the model that the user-centric community has been advocating? It's not my model, it's the model that they've been advocating to say self-sovereign, however, you need to enrich it by bringing in evidence of identity from other reliable, trustworthy sources. So let's criticize that, that framework. Uh, Kate, I'm going to start with you because you had your hand raised. <clears throat> uh, I had my hand raised before, but I'll, I'll, I'll try and answer it. So um, I, I'm not sure that I have a, a, a huge criticism for it. I, I, I have to be honest. Um, I can, I'll, I'll reflect on sort of a personal experience. I remember moving from the US, I lived in the UK for about four and a half years. I was asked to produce things as attestations that I thought were absurd. One made sense, my bank account but a letter from my vicar, you know, <laughs> there was a couple of things that I was sort of questioning that I needed, but I needed to have multiple things in order to prove that I was who I was going to be besides the fact that I had a passport or that I could actually do anything. So I, I, don't, I don't think that it's, I, I think it's a perfectly reasonable and, and seems like a, uh, a basic ability to do it. What I would say, and this is, um, strange background for, for many people on this call, I'm sure, like besides my 15 years working in digital health and digital transformation, I worked for a decade in video games. So we were on the metaverse before the metaverse was called the metaverse. Yeah. And so your ability, don't underestimate your ability and, and the appeal to mask who you are and your ability to mask who you are in the digital world in a way that is rapidly and vastly different than we have grappled with, with the letter from my vicar. So um, that was true when I worked in video games in 2000, 2001 through, 20, to, through 2006. So 
I think we have not really adequately dealt with that problem and so that will continue. Okay, anybody wants to enrich this conversation? Um, yeah, I'd love to jump in on that. I mean, I, so, I mean, needless to say, I 100% believe in that model. It's what we've actually, what we built with Metami, it's the core principle that you have users at the center and they control the information and they attest, they seek attestations from different quality sources and share with those attested data assets with third parties on a minimized information, minimum in, need to know basis, on a minimum information need to know basis. Um, and, and, you know, coming back to Kate's point there on minimization, you know, ultimately when you take this principle of minimization to the apex point, what we really are talking about is anonymization. You know, that's the, if you're minimizing the amount of information that you are disclosing about yourself, uh, um, then the, you ultimately get to an anonymous state and then you just bring in different degrees of identifiability according to where you go, according to the transaction you're trying to do, the, the thing you're trying to get done. And, you know, this is a, a, often a thorny subject because of the inevitable dangers. And so much of the conversation around digital identity is focused on fraud and, and, and criminal activity that there's a bias towards that. But I think personally, and again, I come at this from a human rights perspective, I do not think that you can have human rights in a digital world without some degree of anonymity. And that's not to say that it's appropriate all the time. That's not to say that it's appropriate everywhere, but it is certainly essential that it exists within the system, within the model, if rights are to be preserved. So I think that this is, a, this is an important point that's difficult, but I think it gives you the right context to look at the ecosystem and, and the mechanics of the ecosystem in a healthy manner accordingly. Yeah, excellent. Uh, Dr. Gar? Yeah, uh, I think I just want to say that uh, I, I, identity is not a binary zero one situation. Uh, there would be uh, different uh, levels of credibility attached to different attestations, as you mentioned. And uh, it's quite possible that uh, what we consider or we are, we are saying as a government identity is closer to one. It may not be one. There could be uh, cases of fraud even out there. But the fact remains that we need to recognize that um, uh, different situations would require different level of credibility or authentication, uh, what you call partial authentication, uh, whether you exist as a human being, whether you exist in a certain area, or you need further uh, data. So, uh, and, and, and the more agencies there are, it would only help to build the credibility of that particular uh, agency or that identity. Yeah, I think this is a very, very important point. The fact that Grayscale, bringing in the grayscale in the authentication, in verifying somebody's identity, um, it is definitely a risk-based model. And the relying party has to decide, do they have enough evidence to trust the, the identity that's that's there? And what level are they attributing to it? Uh, it depends on, also on, on, on the interaction at, at play. I mean, if you're, if, you're, if you're launching the nuclear weapons, I mean, clearly it has to be a digital identity with a very different level of attestation. Uh, then if you're getting a $50 voucher to go to a local restaurant. So I think context, which many of you had, had in the private conversation have had, emphasize context, 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 digital identity in the ecosystem and in the context becomes very, very important. Um, Adam and then Maxime, and then I would like to welcome uh, the community voice. Thanks, Joseph. Um, just to go back to your question, I, th I think you were asking specifically about self-sovereign identity and, and that. I just want to raise a couple of challenges that are out there, not necessarily for self-sovereign in itself, but certainly in that user-centered model of identity. And it's the questions of trust, really. So it's the consumer of trust has to understand what it is that I'm presenting to them. If I'm presenting it to them myself as an individual, they have to have some means of reference for checking that, that what I'm telling them is true, 
but it meets the level of trust, as you mentioned, that they are, they're expecting and that it satisfies the question they're asking. So, for example, can I prove that I am over the age of 21 so that I can participate in a particular government scheme? Question mark. So where's my proof coming from? It may come from a government because it may come from my birth registration, for example. But equally, it could come from my my doctor or it could come from other sources. You mentioned your school, Joseph, and it could come from my school from when I registered at school. So th there are numbers of ways I can prove that. So I, I might have the choice of doing that, but there needs to be a means of resolving that trust, if you, if you see. And quite often that means of resolution is referred to under what people call trust frameworks, which are the rules for how these identity systems work. And there, may, and there can be multiple trust frameworks for different purposes in the public and private sector, and there will be many. So yes. that, that's one thing to note. I think the other thing to note is that uh, currently, and this possibly comes to some of the things that Kate was raising about notes from her vicar, um, there are lots of rules, whether they be legal or policy, around, <laughs> around government services that insist on certain things that are just simply not digital. There are still plenty of things that ask for wet signatures, that ask to see documents physically, even though you can present them digitally. So there, there needs to be a lot of work done at the policy and legal level to make sure that those barriers are removed so that you can actually use your digital identity. Um, so there's pl plenty of instances now where I might have a digital, pa digital passport or a digital driving license, but it's just, just not accepted by my own government. So those kind of things need to be resolved. In fact, Adam, this is a very interesting point you raise. I've lived uh, recently and experienced about two weeks negotiating with the regulator about what is an acceptable document, because they were asking for evidence of identity uh, to, to form something in Africa. And for that, they said we needed original documents. And when you explain that original documents don't exist because everything has been digitized, everything is online, even my, my bill from my uh, utility company in order to prove yeah. my, my address, um, I cannot give you, I can print it. And they said, no, it's not acceptable. I said, but I can actually, they said, well, if you received a bill from them, but I said, I can actually print it. And they said, no, it's not acceptable. So we reached, we reached a compromise, which is we were able to find a notary public or a, a, a person of trust who was witnessing my online website, my online login. I logged in, showed him uh, my, my uh, account, uh, my statements, etc. printed them, and then he was able to, to stamp and say, I witnessed the online account and this piece of printout reflects that. It could have been much, much simpler if they simply accepted to verify my online account if I gave them the online credentials. I'm willing to do that. I said, you can do that. They said, we don't have the mechanism to do that. So in the world where we're moving in a digital transformation, our trust frameworks are not yet there. Government trust frameworks are still outdated and still rely on pieces of paper. So we're going through a transition period and sometimes we have to be creative. Maxime. More broadly on that point, right? If we talk about creating this global ecosystem, um, the, the vast majority of endpoints are going to represent individuals or small organizations who don't have the capability to determine the validity of specific attested credentials or 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 um, proof points, if you will, of your identity. So then we get back to this whole model again. Like, okay, so who's going to do that? Which who? What you know? Who's going to provide this service that says you know I'm going to look at Joseph Attic and the and uh, or Kate Wilson and her vicar's letter, right, and decide whether that is valid data. So that's another level of complexity. And again, then we're introducing another, some kind of, you know, independent, is it private public partnership? Is it quasi government, who, you know, some other kind of entity that has to be responsible then for filtering and validating that information. So, you know, 
what does that look like and how does that work? That's my question. I don't know. Yeah, the answer. And, and, and that was very puzzling to me because I offered them information from the state of New York and they said, no, 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 we prefer <laughs> your bill from the um, utility company. So they trust the utility company more than the state of New York. And it kind of surprised me that, that there was this governance mechanism that was not adapted to the, the current realities. So yes, I don't have answers. Luckily, I was able to find a workaround. It took me two weeks and uh, a significant expense, especially at a time when Omicron was right going through the roof and, and nobody was willing to receive me. So um, in any case, this is a story that I learned a lot about digital transformation in the era of Omicron. Um, Omicron. Uh, so I think we have with us um, Modasiru. Could you please introduce yourself? Who, who are you? And uh, state your purpose. And then I'll come back and close. Hello. Um, good, good evening. Oh, is a... Uh... Or morning, wherever, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. I am Muda Siru, uh, Dahiru from Sokoto, State of Nigeria. I'm, the, I'm sorry for uh, missing you. I wanted to join you since the uh, during the hot seat when the uh, important topics have been discussed. Um, and I would like to say two, three things. One, uh, uh, what Nell said, uh, independent identity or tradition. Uh, I don't think uh, uh, it will be possible uh, because uh, most of the organization or agencies in Africa are being uh, identified or are that identified individual are being sponsored by the government. So most of the problem they are facing in Africa is financing. And the issue of also uh, which organization do you think uh, it was reliable that have the capacity or the ability to do that? And let me give you instances in Nigeria like uh, that's why we should see that there are uh, relevant organizations that identify people like uh, international passport, uh, driver license, national population commission, independent commission are the one that necessary. All these identified individual. But if you look at the capacity or ability, the accuracy of uh, capturing individual in Nigeria, that's why we choose NIMSI. NIMSI had 11 digit. And that 11 digit, if you uh, applied it in coding, you came to realize that NIMSI can accommodate the population of Nigeria. Uh, and also want to, in addition to this, I would like to add to what Nell said, it's like AI, it's like we have, the world is moving to metaverse. But uh, I want to draw your attention is that uh, the fundamental tools of metaverse are AI and the blockchain technology. So I agree with him to include emails because most of the exchange wallet uh, for blockchain technology like uh, Coinbase, Binance, Probit, and all these, they use email and the phone number. So I agree. If you include this, it will have been it, it will be green, a, a proofful uh, result. And by and large, we all know that it's the responsibility of government to identify. L let me put it this way: Let's say in in African context, uh, because it Afri is a con uh, is a government that formed the framework, the ecosystem that identify individual that even I. Uh, give an individual a unique number that will identify it from the others. And also Nell mentioned about uh, dead people, uh, teenagers. And I think uh, all the problem we are facing in the world now is lack of identity. Assuming the United Nations will, uh, I think uh, I raised this issue, the United Nations should change uh, sustainable development goals instead of 16.9, that is 16.9 uh, uh, identity, to be to should, to be given more priority. Let's say BB number one, because if we have identity in the world, all this problem will be solved. So I urge the United Nations to look at this issue. Identity is very important. The problem we are facing in the world is lack of identity. Um, I think uh, without taking your time, I, I have to stop here. But I have a lot to say. So sorry for missing you initially. Thank you very much for giving me this chance. Have Thank a nice you. day. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Nile. Do you want to react to the UN? Only no. to say I agree completely. Okay, <laughs> excellent. Um, actually, what, one last topic that we, we really have not covered and then we'll close, which is this notion as we're moving into the metaverse, what is the role of address, physical address? I mean, many KYC um, are now still requiring the, the proof of address 
And I don't know, um, maybe um, Adam, where where is Europe in, in that regard? Is this address in the IDIS 2.0 going out or um, maybe Niall and Adam, anybody else wants to comment? What is the future of address as an identifier that is important? Should we replace it with an option like email or phone number? So you mentioned the EU. Uh, the current EIDAS regulation that's been around since 2014 doesn't include address except as an, an, an optional attribute the actual minimum data required to uniquely identify an ind individual is just their name their, and their date of birth and their place of birth. So, so already back in 2014, we were moving away from address in the EU. What will happen in the new regulation? I suspect that that will continue to be not required in most situations. Um, from my experience in other jurisdictions, uh, certainly in, in the UK, it has been used in the past for means of verifying individuals' identi identity, because during the, the verification process, uh, because we don't have a central repository of, of identity, we have to correlate across lots of different sources. So in that initial interaction at that point in time, it's useful to be able to correlate a lot across lots of different government organisations who currently transact with individuals still through the post. So current address at that point is useful, but it's a point in time and it very rapidly becomes less and less useful. So we've had to introduce things like coping with change of address because people move. Yeah, um, that, That's just a fact of life. We move around. Some, right. uh, some uh, people in society far more than others. Right. In exactly. country, and in some countries, just finished address is even less useful because uh, the postal system either is, isn't capable of identifying individual households well enough or individuals are, are just migratory okay. uh, and have no fixed abode anyway. So it's very difficult to use that data. Right. I, I will go to Kate, uh, but uh, Dr. Garg, if you can think about the issue of address after Kate and then Nadia, you're going to close us. Um, as far as how address plays a role in or doesn't in, in the digital identity scheme of Adhar. So Kate. Uh, so not answering on Adhar, but just in general, I, yes, I yes, would in general. recommend that it's a secondary authenticator where it is applicable, but it is not sort of part of the primary minimum data set ever. Um, the second point, though, that I would uh, say is that looking at how there's both Mundusir's comments as well as this is we have got to focus on the policy changes that take place both within a country where we often keep paper requirements in place as well as across countries where they're so different that where you're seeing as we increase migration as a planet um, we, we've got to be able to figure that out because you will often move to a digital identity or move to a digital system and then have massive paper records on the background. We're wasting a lot of time and money and effort to have some of this done when we don't necessarily always need it. So figuring out what's necessary to still have an identity that can't be erased, yet at the same point in time, not having you know, a requirement that you print out every one of your insurance claims forms in order to viably be able to be reimbursed. So we've got to look at a kind of balance between increasing the policy and rationalizing it and then making sure that what can be eliminated that's redundant is no longer there. This is similar to your story, Joseph. Thanks. In fact, in fact, um, there are studies um, from Century, South Africa, that show that the requirement for address is a major barrier for financial inclusion in Africa. And so if we can advise policy to say, figure out a way to remove address from your requirement, we will have better financial inclusion in the, in, in, along the way. Uh, Dr. Garb, how did you deal with this thorny issue? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, so address as of now uh, continues to be one of the uh, mandatory fields that we collect. But uh, the mobile number is something which has become um, extremely necessary if one is able to utilize the digital identity effectively in order to, in fact, uh, be able to uh, 
use the power of the digital identity, whether it's online authentication or even offline, the mobile has become extremely necessary. So uh, while the address continues to be a field that we collect, uh, the mobile is the field or the number which has really become necessary in order to be able to use Aadhaar as a financial address, in order to be able to do transactions, in order to be able to utilize it in a host of applications. So the mobile, uh, in a way, in terms of the importance, I would say it's become nearly as important as the Aadhaar number itself. I see. Okay. Naim, do you have any anything? Yeah, thank you, Jill. So this, this issue of addresses and, and this concept of residence, which is fast becoming one of the most obsolete con concepts uh, in modern living, and the world is on the move. The amount of temporary migration, te not just temporary agricultural workers crossing borders, the increase in digital nomading that has come about from the pandemic and is going to rapidly expand is making this notion, where is your permanent residence, uh, obsolete. And of course, why do governments, why are they obsessed with this? It's primarily not just where can you vote? Those types of questions. But how can we tax you? We need to know where you are living in order to tax you. And when a lot of the migration is cross-border, where you see a lot of workers now, including in my own country, for example, Facebook employees in Ireland living in Spain, working for Facebook Ireland. The question is, where do we tax them in Ireland or in Spain? These questions are going to become more and more uh, prevalent. And I think you're going to see, unfortunately, governments demanding that they share more and more identity data about citizens crossing borders so that they know how to figure out which economic activity is taxed and in which jurisdiction. So on the one hand, it, it, it increases the freedom of individuals where possible to be able to cross borders and work from foreign locations. But on the downside, that will only centralize identity more uh, in the hands of central government ministries so that taxation uh, uh, can be applied. So again, there's, there's, there's uh, advantages on, on the one hand, but on the other hand, there's disadvantages. Okay, we, we've run out of time. I want to sincerely thank every single one of you. I hope you found it as fascinating as I found it. I really enjoyed talking to you. I really don't get the chance to engage with six people as fascinating as you uh, at the same time. So thank you for that opportunity. And um, I'm sure we will interact with you um, over the coming months and this year. This is a topic that has just started and especially as the metaverse it starts to populate every single week, we see something going on. We're gonna hear a lot about hype confusion, there will be a lot of nonsense as well. And so I think our role as the identity community is to educate the governments and educate the people about what can and cannot be done and, and what are the right policies. There may not be one policy, there may be options, we have to understand the consequences of them, etc. So thank you once again, and thank you for all the attendees. Uh, we will be back with the first part of the trilogy on mobile. Uh, for identity management, inclusive ID4D on February 23rd. Until then, please be safe and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.